Good morning. I, I think we can start. Um, today, I would like to present a um, business report about uh, the activities of the GIGOT Focus Area Unifi Unified Height System. Um, Uh, the objectives of, of the focus areas are uh, to face uh, issues that uh, demands the, the participation or the support of uh, different IAG components. Um, they should be cross-disciplinary. Uh, they should uh, face gaps and identify uh, possibly needed future geodetic products and the focus areas are also incubators for new researcher fields uh, within or uh, in the frame of the IEG. Uh, the strategic planning group uh, of GIGOS in the, in, at the beginnings of the 2000 years uh, defined three initial G uh, focus areas. They were called initially uh, GIGOS teams. And these three focus areas were, was, were a unified height system, a geo, geohazards monitoring and sea level change, including variability and forecasting. Uh, the sea level focus area was uh, discontinuing in 2019. And in 2017, uh, a new uh, focus area was established and it is called geodetic space weather research. Today, I will give, as mentioned uh, now, um, a report about the Unified Height System focus area. Then uh, will Michael uh, present the, the um, recent achievements of the geodetic weather research uh, uh, focus area. Then come the reports of both GIGOS PUROS, uh, BPS and, and networks and observations. And in the afternoon, we will have an update on the focus area uh, geohazards monitoring. Uh, the motivation for this focus area is uh, the fact that uh, most of the existing high systems uh, were established using the mean sea levels as reference level for the determination of these high systems. Uh, they were, in general, established uh, using leveling corrected by gravimetry. But uh, at stake uh, depends on the on the mean sea level. We have different realizations with different um, reference level, which present discrepancies between some decimeters to some meters according to the the um, dynamic ocean topography. Uh, the uh, vertical positioning is static. It means it's very difficult to repeat uh, leveling on the on these uh, reference points to determine possible changes of the height and therefore they are usually static uh, when we have to combine these uh, these uh, high systems with the geoid models or with gps positioning um, we have to to make some approaches and these approaches um, result in a um, in a degradation of the vertical position. And so uh, usually uh, the geoid models will, will be determined as, as better as possible with the most precise um, technologies today. And then we have to adapt these geoid models to the leveling. And in this way, we degrade the accuracy of the geoid models. Um, like also as, as these uh, high systems uh, don't, con don't consider the time variation of the heights and they are locally determined. They present orders of accuracy, one or two orders of accuracy less than the ITLF coordinates. So the motivation uh, was to establish a global unified height system with the objective or refer all existing heights to the same um, equipotential surface or to the same reference level. Um, this is a topic 
that has been discussed in the frame of the IEG since the 1980s. I, I list here, uh, let's say, the, the main publications around this topic, and we, uh, the colleagues, uh, try to solve the problem using different uh, names for the same problem. So, global vertical network, global vertical datum, and you can see here more or less 10, 11 uh, different names for the same problem. Uh, and this, this list of publications provide, provide let's say, the, the um, theoretical support to solve the problem. But, but this was in the conditions of the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, a little bit complicated, but we could get a, a really turning point to solve this problem, and this was the availability of the satellite gravity missions, in particular GOES. Uh, GOES worked from 2009 to 2013, and based on the, on the data, um, captured by GOS, um, we were able to determine a global reference surface to provide this needed here. Uh, of course, the um, resolution is about 100 kilometer, but it is a unified reference level for the complete world. And what we need to do now is to refine this, this resolution of 100 kilometer to a better resolution, by combining, combining this data with terrestrial gravity data. Uh, okay, the GIGOS focus area was established in 2010, and the objective was to provide an international standard for the precise determination of physical heights. This international standard is a reference system for physical heights, and we uh, this, uh, the components for the, this standard were, were classified in the definition of the system, the realization of the systems, standard conventions and procedures to ensure that the realization uh, strictly follows the definition of the systems. And then how can we keep these three elements up to date? So if there, if there is uh, advancements in theory and methods, we need to refine the definition. If there is new stations, we new stations or new data, we need to update the realization and we should also uh, keep up to date uh, standards and conventions according to new models. And then uh, we need the people to do this work because nothing happens without people doing the work. So we need uh, somebody to work here. Um, this part was phased in the first term. This is the, the, they are the same four years uh, tact what, that we have in IEG. Also, this topic was uh, uh, solved or phased in this, in this four years period. Uh, in the last term, we work on the standards and start to work in the realization of the, of the reference system. We are working here in these two things uh, since nine, uh, 2019, and uh, we have some plans to start with this part after the IUGG General Assembly next year in Montreal. Yeah, sorry, in Berlin, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. Also, um, the, the, in the first term, the, the leaders of, uh, of this focus area were Michael Sideris from Canada and Johannes Sider from Germany. Um, and we started with a review about the standards in the existing high systems. And this review uh, is included in the inventory of standards and conventions, the first, the first version prepared, prepared by the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. And these two leaders participated in a ISA project uh, called High Systems Unifications with GOES. Uh, most of the learnings of this project were translated or adopted um, to advance in, in the objectives of the focus area. And uh, 
the first thing they they did was to define a conventional name to solve the problem of the height, uh, the existing height systems. And they say, okay, no more vertical data notification, no more world height data, height system, uh, no more um, global uh, vertical network. We will call this uh, a standard international height reference system. And uh, in the 19 and 20, 13, 2014, was established an ad hoc group to work how the definition and realization of this IHRS uh, should uh, look like. I put here uh, the names on, of the colleagues working in this ad hoc group uh, because, again, uh, without humans, is this not possible? And, the discussions, conclusions, and recommendations of this ad hoc group are contained in this paper, Definition and Proposed Realization of the International High Reference System. And in that, in that paper, it's stated that the primary vertical coordinates are geopotential differences, given with respect to a global conventional W0 value that should decide which of the infinite numbers of equipotential surface we have in the uh, gravity field should be the reference level. So to, to support this definition, we also need to define a W0 value. And then this was faced uh, by a working group of the focus area, uh, in, also I mean in GIGOS, um, co um, called vertical data standardization, and we should uh, make a recommendation about a possible W0 value to be adopted as convention for the EAG. The names of the people behind and uh, the results are uh, contained in this paper, a conventional value for the geoid reference potential. And based on the recommendations of the ad hoc group on the um, IHRS, and the results of this vertical data standardization, uh, we could compile uh, IEG resolution on the definition and realization of the international high reference system. And this resolution was approved by the IEG in the uh, General Assembly uh, in Prague in July 2015. This is the resolution. We have there only five. Uh, uh, fundamental conventions. I don't want to go into the details just to, to show what, what is contained in the resolution. And for the next time, for the next term, also 2015, 2019, we tried to implement this EAG resolution. So to discuss what we need for the realization of the system, the realization is called International High Reference System. So to, to define what we need and how we can proceed to, to make this realization uh, usable. Again, here the names of the people who was, were contributing in this term. Um, and then uh, we concentrated particularly in the standards conventions and procedures we need and in the realization. Uh, we try to do splinter meetings in the different IEG meetings. I mean, uh, symposia or general assemblies. And I would like to especially mention this, this splinter meeting at this symposium because it was really something uh, fantastic. I mean, uh, the, this symposium, uh, about 200 people attended this symposium. And then we made a splinter meeting for the implementation of this resolution. And I mean, we were about 150 colleagues from the 200 in the, in the symposium were attending this meeting and we only talk. So what we can do, uh, where we can take the data, what is missing and the meeting um, take about one hour, one and a half hour and the conclusions of this meeting 
is the basis for everything what we did until now. So it was really a really very, very nice uh, meeting. Uh, at that meeting, we defined five main components, so standards and conventions. Uh, we have to formulate a minimum of, of standards to be satisfied for the uh, reference stations of the high reference frame. Uh, we identified uh, a main challenges to review the processing uh, strategies to determine the vertical coordinates and uh, to provide a support for the vertical data unification if a national or local high systems want to be connected to the global reference system. In this regard, um, in the same symposia, we can define a, a list with the criteria for the selection of the, of the reference stations. Um, based on the criteria defined uh, in this meeting, we could present a preliminary selection in October 2016 to the GIGOS uh, consortium. And um, some recommendations were given here. The recommendations were included in the station selection. And then we go, or that we went to the colleagues responsible for the regional reference frames and the regional uh, GOE determination. Why? Because in this uh, criteria, uh, we said that the uh, reference stations for the high reference frame should be materialized by GNSS continuously st operating stations. And uh, these stations should belong to the ITRF or to the, to the regional reference frames. So we need the geometric colleagues to define the stations. And a second, a second main criterion for this station selection was the availability of gravity data gravity data around the stations to compute with mm, some reliability the potential values. And this data is in the hands of the colleagues computing the joy. So we have to go to both commissions. And with uh, their help, uh, we could refine this preliminary station selection. And uh, it looks uh, like in this, in this, uh, on this map, we have um, about 168 stations. Um, our proposal is to have a global core network that should be extended by regional and national specifications in the same way we uh, do with the ITRF. Again, they have to be materialized by GNS continuously operating stations and stations belonging to the ITRF and the reference frames are preferred because we need to know the, the geometric position or the ITRF position of the stations uh, with uh, height accuracy. Uh, we have collocation with Bell, BI, SLR, Doris, absolute gravimetry. Uh, some uh, type gauges use a uh, reference for the local high system. And also we have a collocation with the national uh, leveling networks. Uh, you can see here, sorry, you can see here uh, the date of this uh, map. This is uh, March 2021. And so then uh, nothing has happened, but if one of these stations is the commission, then uh, the um, regional responsible for the stations, uh, they contact with us and they inform that the station doesn't exist and then we look for a, a replacement. This is working good, uh, well, uh, but until now uh, we are trying to uh, compute the potential values of the vertical coordinates for these stations. Uh, regarding uh, the vertical data unification, uh, we make a review of the existing studies um, in this topic, uh, we take as a main input the results of this ESE pre project and some uh, empirical computations in North and South America. And we publish a guide, a um, very, um, very detailed guide 
how uh, every country or an, a region can uh, unify his road, uh, vertical existing high system into the, uh, the global reference system. Um, yeah, we provide uh, some information about the data required, the accuracy for this data, what they can do to improve the data distribution, and, and really is a, a very, a very detailed guide for the unification of the existing high systems into the global one. Uh, regarding the, the determination of the potential values, uh, this, this was uh, really challenging because um, 2015 and 16, 16, we tried to, to compute the potential values for the network I showed you, but we get very, very different results. So we decided or we identified a main, as a main issue the necessity to calibrate or to compare a different computation methods to see if the difference in the results depends on the method or on the availability of uh, data, the input data. And we could initiate the so-called Colorado experiment. It is called Colorado because we get a lot of gravity data in this uh, US state. And the idea were to take this data to compute potential values, geoid and quasi geoid using exactly the same input gravity data, but uh, the own computation programs of software of different colleagues to see where the difference uh, are coming from. Uh, you can see here uh, the different IEG entities contributing to this initiative. Uh, the Colorado experiment was initiated in COVID in the General Assembly 2017. Uh, the chairs of these uh, different working groups or study groups uh, prepared a, a basic set of uh, meet the, uh, with the standards and some definitions to, pro to be provided also together with the Colorado data. So we, we need to, to ensure that all the working uh, computation groups are using the same ellipsoid and the same mass density and uh, this kind of, of um, small things <laughs> also the, that can, could produce large differences in the results. So we prepare a set of uh, basic standards to be used uh, in combination with the Colorado data. The data was distributed, was, were distributed in 2018 and we uh, performed the first computation between February and August 2018. Uh, initially, we have 10 uh, computation groups. We compared the results at this meeting in Copenhagen, and uh, we got differences up to one meter and many decimeters. And we have to refine this, this uh, set of basic standards. So uh, there, is, there were no no enough, but we hear uh, what we prepare here, and we have to extend this set of basic standards, and then a new computation. So a first iteration for the Colorado experiment was started, but in this uh, in this uh, time we get fifty contributions. In July 2019, in Montreal, we could compare the the results of this uh, computation. And then we have to make again uh, a new iteration. And in May 2020, we decided that these are the final results. And these results uh, were compared in two different papers. One um, concentrates on the geoid comparison, and the other one concentrates on the potential determination and comparison. And we set up a special issue in the Journal of Geodesy called uh, Reference Systems in Physical Geodesy, because uh, there we have not only contributions for the high reference uh, frame and the geoid computation, but also for the determination of the international uh, gravity uh, reference frame. Uh, 
I will not go into the details. These are the different uh, groups contributing to the Colorado ex experiment. And what is interesting here are the countries. You can see here the many countries who participated in this, in this experiment. And it was also um, a very nice, a very nice experience. Uh, in addition to, to the results in, in the different methods, uh, I think one of the main outputs of this experiment is the availability of the input data. So you can see here, this is the terrestrial data. This is airborne gravity data. This is um, GPS uh, leveling data in the old uh, gravity uh, leveling network uh, of USA. But we have also here uh, leveling lined with validation data. Also along this line was a first order leveling. Uh, we have also GNSS positioning. We, we have also um, um, deflections of the vertical. This is a very nice uh, set of validation data. And all this data is freely available at the International Service of the Geoid. If someone wants to check how you, uh, his, his or her software is performing in the computation of the GEOID, uh, this person can uh, download this data, make the computations, and compare his or her results with the results of the other 14 groups. And this is, this is really something what contributes to the GEOID determination worldwide. Also, the International uh, Service for the GEOID make um, a specific uh, web page for the Colorado experiment. There are all the input data and also the 14 final solutions provided by the other, uh, by the groups. Okay. Based on the results of the Colorado uh, experiment, we could prepare an extensive guideline for the realization of the high reference system. We include there a catalog with basic standards and conventions, such as numerical, numerical, numerical constants, the reference ellipsoid, zero degree and mass center convention, and also the handling of permanent tight effects. And this is here particularly important because the ITRF is computed in tight free system or and the um, resolution for the high reference system uh, states that the vertical coordinates should be given in mean tight system. So we developed all needed um, formulas to, to take into account this difference. Uh, then we split the word in three um, large regions or uh, characteristics. And they are the regions with good surface gravity data, regions without or very few surface gravity data, and regions with some gravity data, but no, no very well as here. And depending on these characteristics, we provide some recommendations for the determination and evaluation of the vertical uh, coordinates. Additional, we include also um, some recommendations for the improvement of the input data uh, for the station installation in regional and national densifications and uh, some key points to ensure the usability and long-term sustainability of the high reference frame. Uh, again, here are the names of, of the colleagues working on this and what is important here is you can see the different IEG components contributing to this initiative. So this, this was really an IEG achievement. Um, all, all these uh, uh, details are contained in this paper, a strategy for the realization of the IHHRF. Uh, I have mentioned some papers along this presentation and I have to um, highlight the fact that all of these papers are published open access in order that everyone interested on this topic can download the paper without paying for, and especially the colleagues from, from the developing countries. 
Um, the results of the Colorado experiment also motivated the release of a new IEG resolution on the, on the IHRF, and it, it happens in Montreal. And here is recognized uh, the work of the different uh, IAG uh, components contributing to this work and asking the member countries to, to take in consideration the recommendations given by, by this uh, group. Uh, what are we doing now? Um, we are working uh, in some research uh, uh, hot topics because there is still open questions to be solved. Um, we have not identified totally the discrepancies between the different solutions, so we are still working on this problem. We need to improve the quality assessment in the determination of the potential values because we are, we are using exactly the same methods for the geoid computation. And today we can define a mean average uh, accuracy for the joint model, but point vice point is this not possible. So we are also to face or to solve this problem. And we are also trying to identify which methods we can apply to determine the variation of the potential with time. Uh, this is doing by different working groups or the study groups in the IEG, but we are also trying to advance in this problem uh, in a pragmatic way. And we decided to compute the first solution for the IHRF using what we have, what is, is available. Uh, for that, we are working with different colleagues um, responsible for the joint determination at local and global uh, level. And uh, we are trying to define a guideline to recover potential values uh, from existing joint models. Again, here you can see this part is, be, is being be made by colleagues from the subcommissions on the regional GOE determination. They are about 40 colleagues. And we have new working groups and study groups for the term 2019 to 2023. And everyone is also contributing in these activities. Uh, here are uh, the stations that we selected, and um, this part is being computed by the colleagues in North America. Here are the CIRGAS colleagues, here in Africa, in Europe, Japan, and uh, Australia and New Zealand are, are contributing. And uh, to, to be sure about the quality of this data, uh, we should have um, two computations for the same points. I mean that two different groups determine the potentials for the same points to compare these results or the software uh, employed for the determination of the potential values should be previously evaluated in the Colorado experiment. So we need to ensure the quality of the results. Uh, and this is it's working very, very well, I think. We have shown uh, the um, red dots uh, show the points. We uh, have already put, uh, the vertical coordinates. Uh, we are working right now with South America and Africa. We need to, to assess the accuracy of, of these blue uh, dots. And for the green dots, uh, we don't have a um, particular partner to compute these, these uh, values. But for that, we have the global gravity models and also some gravity models in the ISG repository. Uh, the next. So uh, we want to present the first uh, solution for the IHRF at the IUGG General Assembly in Berlin. Uh, like in everything done in the IAG, uh, Achievements are based on voluntary contribution and best effort practice. So nobody has to participate in the 
IGHRF activities. Everything what we have reached today is motivation and the clear needs of the colleagues to improve um, or to evaluate their methods. Uh, a huge progress, progress is reached, but we need to ensure the maintenance and the continuity of the IGRF in a long-term basis. And following the IEJEC practices, we think that developments, uh, we need in theory to better or to increase the accuracy of the IHRF should be take place within the IEG commissions, the Intercommission Committee on Theory, and the different working groups and study groups uh, supported here, also in combination with the IEG services. And the operational performance should be ensured by the IEG services. So uh, we are proposing to install an I, I HRF element in the International Gravity Field Service that should take care of coordinating and continuing the activities that we have developed until now for the establishment and sustainability of the high reference frame. Uh, our proposal is to have a coordination center at the, at the IGFS uh, we need to maintain the conventions and the network. Based on these two components, we can't continue working with the regional colleagues in the joint, uh, um, responsible for the joint determination to determine the high reference frame coordinates. Then uh, we need to collect these results uh, and to validate these results. Uh, for that, we are proposing the same what we are doing now, so redundancy in the computations that we have one, two or three solutions for the same points to see um, how the agreement between them, um, how is the agreement between them, or the method used for the computation of the particular regional potential values is calibrated within the Colorado experiment or with the Colorado data. Uh, then we need to provide the results, including the metadata and giving some, uh, I mean, that we can't publish results with some officiality from the IGFS. And the interaction with the existing uh, IEG components or, uh, or another IEG services. Uh, so we have to keep this maintenance in accordance with the developments in these three components. For the reference network, we have also to interact with, the, with these elements here. The input data is already provided by some components of, of gravity field services here. And uh, the results, some results have to be also distributed to the uh, other uh, gravity services and at the end, the, the users. Um, the terms of reference for this coordination center are in preparation. Uh, we want to, to um, um, really the International Gravity Field Service wants to, to present a first draft to the IEG executive, executive committee by, I don't know, February, March next year. Uh, in order to get this coordination center approved in, in um, the next assembly in Berlin. And we can say that if we get this coordination center approved, the, the goals of the focus area unified high system can be declared as accomplished. And the IHRF activities will be assimilated by the uh, IEG commissions, Intercommission Committee on Theory, and the uh, Gravity Field Service. And then we will have place in, in GIGOS to have um, another focus area concentrated in another problem. Uh, to conclude, I would like to, to mention this. Probably you know that a new height for uh, the Mount Everest was published 
by the end of 2020. And this is a, a newspaper article. And this newspaper and the, it is explicitly mentioned that the new height of Mount Everest referred to the international height reference system. What is, is quite nice because this is a nice advertisement and uh, every when, when we have to talk about the height reference system, we mention the new height of Mount Everest. That's all, thank you. Questions or comments? Thank you, Laura, for the nice presentation and uh, congratulations for all the work you did since the beginning. I think it is not easy to come up with uh, this type of uh, uh, work without the contribution of many people, as you mentioned already. Uh, I have a very specific question. During the Hutin Marusi Symposium this year in Milano, there was a discussion regarding the quasi-geoid. Quasi and there was an idea by Fernando Sanso and others to abolish the usage of quasi-geoid because it has no physical meaning. I know there are countries who are using quasi-geoid as a reference surface. Would this impact the IHRF re uh, implementation in the world? Um, the definition of the vertical coordinates are potential differences. So the potential of a point with respect to a W0 value, and with this difference, you can obtain orthometric heights <coughs> and use the geoid, or you can um, obtain normal heights and use the quasi-geoid. And, and this should be the decision of everyone what's Um, can you can you hear me? This is Ricardo. Uh, so, uh, just a second. I think they, this is they are preparing a resolution for that, and that might have an impact at the national level because a number yeah. of countries are using that way. Mm, th this is this is really an accuracy problem because mm, uh, um, the, the, what uh, Fernando is proposing is to use all with the geoid as reference surface, even though we have normal heights. By the difference between normal orthometric heights in regions with mountains can reach one meter. And if we want to have, or we want to go to the one millimeter precision, we have to respect the quasi geoid also a reference surface. Uh, if the people want to use the, the the reference surface. This is very difficult, but okay. I'm in favor of normal heights, uh, but other people is in favor uh, in favor of of joint heights. And so my my question goes in the same direction. Could you please move to slide twenty two? Twenty two. No, it's frozen. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, here. Yes. Uh, no, then it was 20. 20. At 20. Okay. Here. No. Yeah, here. Uh -huh. So, um, goes same direction. Uh, I understood so far you just try to uh, homogenize the potential values. But when you talk about in the last bullet point strategies for determination of IHRF coordinates. What do you understand as coordinates? The, the it be heights in met metric heights. Uh, yeah. Also, the, 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 um, I have to go <coughs> back uh, to, um, <clears throat> sorry, here. Also, the primary coordinates are potential differences. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's here, and you can divide this potential difference by a gravity value and then you get the height the metric height 
uh, of, of you get normal orthometric height depends on the gravity value you use to divide this or to convert this potential difference to meters. Yes, yes. But at the end, I think it's only halfway what you have achieved so far. If you talk about an international height reference frame, it should be given in metric. Metric, me I, I, I know the basic, I know potential values. Okay. But people want to get metric heights. And so, yeah. You know that in different countries, there are different legal bases, legal requirements. Yeah. So why not giving for the 170 uh, stations that you have normal heights? and orthometric heights also we, we can provide normal heights for the automatic yeah. orthometric height is very complicated but there is about 20 ways to compute yes. the, the orthometric yes. heights yes. and uh, i but mean then still it's not unified no on and and so our our recommendation is to use normal heights because you can't um you can ensure the repetibility of the heights with orthometric heights, so orthometric heights, for the orthometric heights, you need a last name. So the first name is orthometric height and the last name, Helmert, uh, Ramsayer, or... And, and there are also countries that require dynamic heights, dynamical heights. Oh, that this is, this is um, very, very easy also. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy. But anyway, uh, at we the will, end, you should have three, three numbers. Uh, <laughs> ne, ne. We will provide normal heights, but if we want to, to determine orthometric heights, we have to consider 20 different methods using one density. If you want to vary the density, then we will have 100, 100 values for orthometric heights. And this is, this is quite... It's, Um, yeah, yeah, but then it's not satisfying if you have 10 different, uh, different orthometric heights. It's not very um, for the normal user of the heights. It, we have to keep in mind that the normal user of the heights use the existing height systems. And so I, I think, for instance, um, in Europe, the, high, the existing height systems are very precise. They don't need the, the international height reference system. If you want to, to do an engineer construction, let's say in, in Amazonas, you will need a reference point and you can use the uh, reference and, and high reference uh, frame point as reference and then derive the, the heights you want to. So we have to distinguish here between the ITRF and the IHRF. The ITRF had to, has to be used while the people are using GNSS. By the IGRF, uh, we don't have this mandatory uh, usability. Uh, Laura, can you, can you hear me? Uh, just, uh, uh, Ricardo, one second, please. We have two comments here in the okay. room, and then uh, we go to the virtual people. Okay, thank you. I just want to talk about the experience in Chiergas. I am the representative of IAB in Chiergas, South America. And uh, as in Europe, we made the recommendation in Chiergas, all South America uses normal heights. And this was a resolution of the Chiergas uh, committee. And then after one year, Brazil told us, no, we do not accept it. We will continue with automatic height, with one type of automatic height. So what shall we do? We cannot forbid Brazil to use uh, orthometric heights, even if we have a resolution that the normal height should be accepted. And therefore, there was a compromise of both. We only use these pure potential numbers. And I think everybody, every user is able to divide the pure potential numbers by gamma, the normal gravity, or by any G, the mean gravity between the point and the geoid. If you can, if a user cannot divide, I don't know whether we have to take care of that. Um, uh, I, I want to support really Laura uh, and uh, Harald. What you mentioned in principle is the discussion using uh, geoid or quasi-geoid computation. 
And uh, this in immediately tells us that it doesn't make sense to do a GWEED as the baseline, because there you have to use pre-assumptions, which uh, you have to reduce your gravity data down to the GWEED, which you don't know where it is, and you need to use all what is in between all the masses. That means, therefore, it was used the, the quasi GWEED or the normal heights uh, in order to get rid of that. Okay, in the other procedure, this is Modudensky approach, then you do also assumptions because you, you, you assume that you are on an equipotential surface when you do your computations, which is not true because of it is not the surface is not an equipotential surface. So these are the tricky things which are behind all this uh, stuff. And uh, to be on the safe side, for sure, uh, normal heights or quasi geoid is the better solution in my view, in any case. And uh, it's no re there is no reason not to use, okay, I know that the geo uh, uh, potential values is not the ideal quantity because nobody can imagine what that is for sure. But um, there is no other way to, to use a unique number in order to, to define this as the reference surface. There is no other way. Other, as long as you don't make any pre-assumptions, uh, yeah, it, that. If, we, we, if we want to, to publish orthometry heights, we will have as many high reference frames as orthometric heights. And, and the idea is to have a unified high system. So, uh, Ricardo? Yeah, uh, just a few words about the discussion that I've heard right now. Um, at the moment, as Lola said, we are concentrating on uh, refining a common or a standard or a suitable way for getting W values. And this is the origin for, you know, any height system. So uh, I guess that the discussion that I heard is reasonable, obviously. Uh, we have to define in some way the height that we want to have in the height system. But at the moment, I guess that we have to focus on uh, the W value because still there are problems, still there are discrepancies, and the Colorado test proved that quite easily. So <clears throat> I guess that at the moment, the discussion that I heard is, you know, too advanced, so to say, in some sense. But you are right, we have to define a height system, and uh, um, this can be done through some kind of, or a focus area, for instance, of GIGOS in order to define convention and so on. Uh, as another comment, I'm not completely against automatic height because this depends on, okay, there are many different ways, but it's a matter of defining the standards as has been done for many, many, many other uh, topics in geodesy. So it's a matter of finding out a common way of transferring one height system to the other and having you know the way for uh, sounds transformations that's it and it is not the way of referring some some heights in with respect to the other at least in my view yeah if, if we have potential values exactly everyone can use orthometric heights if we want or we can uh, use normal yeah. height and so according, they, according they, to some some established standards the, 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 there are the, the, density problems and many other topics like that but if you have standards, you can say, okay, this is my way for computing things. And also, obviously, you can adapt the uh, normal heights as well. It is no matter. And so the, the, the characteristic unified height system is given by the potential values. Yeah. This is written in the um, Morris book. resolution. In, oh, even in the Morris book. <laughs> because when yeah. you start talking, when, when uh, you start reading what is the height system uh, the, in, the, in this book, it is stated that one can derive uh, the values given the potentials, so. But, but really this, this discussion is very old. Uh, sure. It has been no, it is important. many times. Yeah, yeah. But and, and if we continue yeah, yeah. discussing this topic, <laughs> we will not advance in this. No, but it is important to discuss it and to uh, define practically what we want to have, because in yeah. theory, everything has been established since, you know. So, uh, we, have, we, we have to respect what the, the countries decide. That's if, we want, see, if they want to, to work with orthometric heights, we provide the basis for the computation of the orthometric heights. If the other countries want to work with normal heights, 
we provide the geopotential values to determine. But what it, let me just add that what it is important in to is to find a common reference point. And at the moment, the common reference point is the potential. Yeah. And uh, it is, uh, well, in my opinion, it has been a very strong step forward with respect to what we had in the past. And in the past, the discussion was not even addressed, and we have a consistency of the I system or the potential, whatever you like, at the level of, you know, one meter, two meters worldwide. Now we are approaching the two centimeters, to say, yeah. and it is a very, very important step forward. Uh, Thomas? Just may, may I add one thing? One solution to the problem would be to, pro to place your reference point at the tight gauges. Uh, then you don't then you don't have the problem anymore. Um, that, that I don't want to change anything, but uh, I have another point which, in my view, is very important, not not technical point. Uh, it's about um, more giving more visibility of uh, the importance of height systems uh, to let's say the general public or in general. Uh, the, the reason why I'm saying that is uh, last May there was an ESAM uh, Living Planet per, uh, Symposium and they were presented the requirements for future gravity missions and there was not presented any requirement from geodesy in this presentation. And I, I was in the, in, the, in the meeting there and, and then I, I asked the question afterwards, why don't you present don't you define any requirements from geodesy? They have requirements from uh, from hydrology, ice, whatever, and not, but none geodet geodetic requirements. And this is strongly linked to that. Uh, then I ask the question, and then what usually happens when you ask such kind of question, it bounces back to you. Uh, yeah, please prepare something. Okay, I did something. Laura also reviewed that. Uh, in the meantime, there are requirements, but uh, we have to be, let's say, more 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 proactive to to advertise the requirements for example for future gravity missions uh, which are re, uh, related to height systems it's very important otherwise we get lost here yeah um, the last the last one because we have to to continue um yeah uh, Jürgen I come to you right now okay I, I can also ask my question uh as such, if I'm allowed. Yeah, first I, have, I want to uh, support that uh, the potential value is, is a really unique uh, quantity that we can use. Everything else is some kind of transformation, uh, which is uh, where we cannot reach this accuracy. So they, I, I completely support what, what uh, Thomas and uh, Laura has presented. My question is, I have seen on one of the slides that you have major gaps in the area of, of Asia. You have only Japan and, and China and, and, and many parts are missing. And this is my question. Mm -hmm. uh, what are plans for, for Asia? And do you not have Chinese co uh, colleagues who can uh, support you? Uh, yes, uh, we, we are in contact with the uh, colleagues from China and from Russia. In the particular case of China, uh, they are trying to, to compute the UID, but they are in the initial steps. And the idea is uh, when, he, when they have some results, they will contribute to the, to the reference frame, but the, in the moment, right now it's not possible. But, but, um, 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 in, in, in fact, one of the study graphs is coordinated by a colleague from China. Yeah, I, I have seen it. So uh, does in Asia not exist a, a group like for the Euro European GEOID, uh, some uh, uh, bigger group? Uh, or for North America, South America, you have big groups, but it, uh, you, in, in Asia, you only have the countries, China, Russia, it's Japan. A, we we have contacts okay and, and we try to 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 have them here and okay we are working on <laughs> okay thanks sorry my suggestion is not technical at all but I, I think after the discussion that it would be interesting to have a specific chapter about high systems in the irs convention you know that they are under renewal there are about 10 chapters and probably it's difficult to have a new chapter finished in one year. Uh, but uh, in the, the next uh, window will open maybe in some year. There is, there is a lot of liter literature about the high systems. 
and there is a lot of publications where you can see how man 100 different types of optometric heights you can compute. I, I think if we if we want to if we want to standardize, we cannot go to, to the to the metric heights. I, um, I, as um, Thomas and, and Jargon say, uh, we are so a reference frame has to be the best product we should have. And in terms of high reference, the best product what we can could have are potential values. And for the for the practice, okay, for the they, they are using on or of course or um, metric heights, uh, and they can continue working what what they have, but. But really, to in, in the conventions for the IGRF, we recommend normal heights. Ready, everyone who knows what a height reference is, they know uh, if he wants to compute normal heights, they use here. If he wants to compute optometric heights, he knows what he has to use. But if we if we keep this discussion open, we will not do nothing. This this work was tried. I, I don't know in the in the last 30, 40 years to standardize optometric heights, and you get different results. And this that they are not uh, differences of five or ten centimeters. In in the Andes region, we get optometric heights with one meter difference. So we cannot provide this information. Uh, I think we have to continue. Yeah, thank you. So good morning, good morning together. So we will continue now with the report on the next focus area. So I want to give a report on the focus area geodetic space weather research. So actually the presentation will consist of three parts. First, I will give an introduction into the topic, and then we have uh, two online presentations. The first will be given by Fabrizio Proll and the second one by Ezan Furuta. So I will start uh, with the motivation, the general information about the focus area. Uh, so Ethan Foltan, uh, as uh, shown here on that first slide, is the vice chair, and he is from uh, Denmark, and he take over this uh, vice chair, in, uh, I think, in 2019 from uh, Klaus Berger. So um, actually, uh, Laura already said that the focus area was installed in 2017, and we had our first uh, session or first uh, larger meetings at the IUGG in Montreal in 2019. At that uh, meeting, at that conference, we set up the structure of the focus area. The structure could be uh, visualized here by such a so-called double uh, tetrahedron. And uh, the basic component, so in the mid, so that what is now here circled in red, is the magnetosphere, ionosphere, plasmosphere, thermosphere part, also uh, denoted as MIT or MIPT, if we include the plasmosphere as an, uh, a separate uh, uh, part of this model. And we also include then these couplings. So we have between all these different uh, spheres, uh, physical dynamical coupling processes, which need to be modeled in a certain way. So the yellow colored part of this uh, uh, structure is related to geodetic applications. So we have on the one hand side, the precise orbit determination here where the thermosphere plays a large role. We have then the precise point positioning, PPP. Uh, we have the precise navigation uh, where then the space geodetic observation techniques uh, are included. And then we have also some magnetospheric uh, information. So uh, the blue colored parts are related to space weather. So here we have 
the solar observations also come to uh, that in more detail in the next on the next slide so that means we bring everything together we have on the one hand side our space geodetic observation techniques on the other hand also solar observation and that's all together plays a role in the studies in the work in the geodetic space weather research focus area so what we do in this way is that we bring the whole change of physical processes between the sun and the earth surface into play so here I have a figure where we have an overview about the different observation techniques and we see here the Earth, we have the Sun, and we have here, if you look at this uh, orbit, so this is actually the orbit of the Earth, and uh, then we have here also the so-called stereo satellites, this is one stereo satellite, there's the other one, so these two satellites are orbiting the Sun in the same manner as the Earth, so on the same trajectory, and uh, these uh, two satellites, they are of course a solar mission, and this, uh, these satellites observe the surface of the Sun, actually in the moment, or not only in the moment, for the rest of the lifetime, only one of these uh, uh, stereo satellites is working, uh, but we can observe in this this way the the the, up the surface of the earth uh, the surface of the sun in near real time to detect active regions like uh, sunspots we have in the other on the other hand here in the lagrange point different solar missions uh, we have ace uh, so this is written here the ace to discover and the soho mission they observe uh, the, the 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 solar wind the solar storm they also observe uh, uh, extreme ultraviolet radiation x-ray also magnetic field components so that means there we have a lot of information which is uh, important for model these uh, four subcomponents I showed before in the structure. So now the question is where is geodesy coming into play? So geodesy is coming into play if we look here closer to the Earth. So there we have all the space geodetic techniques. Uh, they uh, bring the information about the ionosphere, plasmosphere, and thermosphere into play, as I said, PPP, so uh, then also POD and PN. These are applications where we see the direct relation between geodesy and uh, these different components of uh, the uh, higher upper atmosphere. So um, then also we have to consider that what is important for this uh, focus area is that in geodesy we have a very large history and large experience in developing uh, sophisticated analysis techniques and modeling approaches. And this together with the space geodetic techniques is our uh, idea or our motivation is uh, that we have to deal with the topic space weather monitoring because geodesy plays a very big role in that. So uh, one very important challenge is to combine the measurements from the solar missions and from the space geodetic observation techniques, as I showed you on the slides before. So this is a great challenge and we have very different observation techniques which we have to combine and therefore a lot of work has to be done in this context and this is one part of our uh, uh, focus area. This is mainly done in the uh, working group number four, I will tell you later. So. It is um, this combination is a very important basis for the main objectives of the focus area. So the development of an improved ionosphere model, then an improved uh, thermosphere density model. These two can be then also uh, extended by a plasmosphere model. And uh, we have, as I already showed you, to consider the coupling processes within that system. And uh, this is the third uh, objective. The fourth objective is then finally to get an improved understanding of the space weather events and the monitoring by space weather observations, which will then also help to make forecasts so that we have then maybe a warning system for space weather events. But this is not really part of the uh, geodetic space weather research focus area. So the first objective is related to the electron density, the second to the thermospheric density. So in these are connected quantities. They are connected because of the physical, physical coupling processes. And in the context of these essential geodetic variables, the EGVs, we think that uh, both uh, uh, densities should be uh, uh, geodetic, so essential geodetic variables. And uh, they also are then provided as GDOC, GDOC, uh, GDOS products to the users. So to do all that work, we set up four groups. So one study group, one joint study group. This is the joint study group number one. It is actually implemented in the ICCT because it is more related to a theory, uh, but it is co-organized by the focus area. 
Then we have the three working groups, uh, say, uh, joint working group number one, electron density modeling. This is uh, like all the other two working groups uh, co-organized or joined with the IAG Commission 4. So the second uh, joint working group is improvement of thermosphere models. The third one is improved understanding of space weather events and their monitoring by satellite missions. So now I will give a short overview about that, what is done in these different uh, study and working groups. The first uh, study group, this is that one which is related to the ICCT. It is uh, chaired by Andres Calabria, who is now uh, in Spain. He was for a long time in China. And uh, uh, I also want to mention that we have here 17 group members. Uh, recent activities, I cannot list now all that was written here on that slide. Uh, we have uh, international cooperations. We have a lot of papers, manuscript conferences where these members uh, took place and and uh, published their uh, interesting work, uh, projects, and so on. More important is maybe that uh, related to the present work. So the present work, I want to uh, give some insight on the second point. There is a collaboration scheme with the low latitude ionospheric research working group of the Asia Oceanic Society of Geosciences, so AONTS. This is a very new, this was uh, 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 this uh, the collaboration was started in this year, so in 2022. And they are on a good way to have their a very important uh, collaboration with that group. Also in the third uh, item here, we have the collaboration scheme with young uh, system science scientists. So we see here that also a lot of outreach is done in this context. Future plans, uh, they want to organize a coupling uh, a uh, um, conference or workshop and uh, they're organizing already. They have an interesting web uh, site in ResearchGate and they also write, uh, provide a lot of papers. I cannot go into, into any detail concerning these uh, theoretical uh, investigations and progress what they did because this is actually too much. Um, yeah, the second uh, group is the first joint working group, electron density modeling, which is chaired by Fabrizio. Fabrizio will then, after my presentation, give, uh, give an own presentation about that, what, what they are doing. They have 18 group members, and very important are these electron density tomography models, and this is what also Fabrizio will tell us something about. So I do not want to go into too much details. What is important that they want also to work on simulation. So we have here creating a simulation case. This is something what is one of the most important uh, ideas of the of the work of this focus area to have simulation studies. So I will switch to the next working group. This is the uh, working group number two related to the thermosphere. Here, I will then later, or we will later uh, listen to a talk of Isan, who will give also some information about that. And finally, then we have the joint working group number three, which is chaired by Heike Liu. She take over the chair from Alberto Garcia Rigo from Spain. And uh, uh, Benedict is the vice chair, and we have 11 members in that group. And here we have then also, if we look at this, the future plans and uh, that we present here, we have to, and this group, the combination of what, we, what I said at the beginning, where we want to combine the space weather measurements and the space geodetic measurements. This is done in this group mainly, and uh, this is in, on a good way, but you, as I said, it is a challenge and there are many additional information have to be done. Um, yeah, this is then here, combination of measurements and estimates derived from space geodetic observation techniques and from solar spacecraft missions and so on. Yeah, I will give some more information about that, what we did in addition to this. Uh, so here uh, I want to give information about uh, conferences we already had in this year. So I want to concentrate on 2022 and on the uh, future. We had a um, uh, um, part, or we organized a part of the uh, EGU uh, session G5.1, Ionosphere, Thermosphere, and Space Weather. Uh, and there, uh, Ezan and me, we have been co convener uh, I was a co convener and Ezan was the uh, convener of this session. And we had all together 15 PICO presentations, which deals with this, what we are doing here in our focus area. Then the most important event was for, for us, the second IAG Commission 4 symposium, what took place in Potsdam at the beginning of September. 
There we have been co-organizing a partner of the IAG Commission Forum. So that means one day, so actually the Thursday was related to that what we did here or what we are doing in the focus area. We had uh, eight oral presentations, uh, three invited talk, and this was uh, chaired by Isan and me. And uh, uh, we, I also want to mention that we had in this conference two splinter meetings. The first splinter meeting was a joint splinter meeting together with the subcommission 4.3 atmospheric remote sensing from IAG. And uh, there we uh, reported or all the chairs of the different working study groups reported on that what they did in the last year. And uh, we had a lot of discussions and this was a really long uh, splinter meeting because of the many groups uh, and uh, study and working groups we brought together. Uh, then we had an interesting splinter meeting together with colleagues from Yaga. So we are planning to have a cooperation with Yaga. So Yaga is the International Association of Geomagnetism and Aeronomy. And uh, this was for the first time that we sit together. Sit together is not the right word because this was an online uh, meeting. The rest was more or less, it was a hybrid conference actually. And uh, then we had uh, set up first ideas how we can cooperate. And that should be then continued now at the IU IUGG next year in, in Berlin. So to get up a closer cooperation with Yaga. Um, yeah, then uh, we also will set up a session again for the next EGU in Vienna, like we did it in this year. We will have a PICO session again. And this, uh, this uh, session will then also uh, again, partly dedicated to the uh, focus area. And uh, then in the next uh, bullet here, then the IOGG is mentioned. Uh, there we set up a, a own session. Uh, this uh, session is the symposium JG03, remote sensing and modeling of the atmosphere. And uh, there we have also included IAG and, and Yaga. So this is related then also to that, what we are doing in the focus area. We finally uh, mentioned that here, it's national, actually a national event where we uh, set up uh, uh, yeah, in the document for, for Germany for the space, from the space weather community that includes recommendations uh, for enhancing the German space weather capabilities and capacities. This is a national uh, work, but anyway, a lot of experience from other countries came here into that. So therefore we can also say it's something international. So activities for the uh, period until 2023 and beyond. So what I already mentioned, we want to do a lot of simulations because this is, I think, the basis for, for studying uh, all these, uh, uh, yeah, I, this, this, uh, 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 all these, these uh, parts of our, our work. And uh, there we want to uh, assess then the impact of space weather on technical systems and so on. So this is something what needs to be decided in uh, Berlin that during the IOGG, where we have then, uh, I think, a very large meeting on these uh, things. We want to further develop the ionosphere and thermosphere models, or also maps as it is always so often called. And they are then provided as GIGOS products. They are also, if you look into the GIGOS website, you will find that there. Uh, that we already have a, a few uh, products, but this is still on, on the first level, let's say. Uh, then the results of, of the different uh, study and working groups needs to be uh, combined so that we can really investigate in the coupling processes. And that also means that some uh, physical models like the TIE TCM model many people are using should be then used for comparisons. Uh, recommendations for applications uh, should be uh, then formulated and uh, for precess orbit determination, then also for PPP, PPP and so precess navigation. We know all uh, autonomous driving, precess farming for all that. These uh, models could be of a very uh, large importance. Collision analysis, re-entry computations are two other uh, uh, um, problems. So then I would now go to the two presentations. The first one will be from Fabrizio, imaging the three-dimensional ion sphere by global scale tomography. And then the next would be by ESON, increasing the application of spaceborne measurements for predicting multi-level global thermospheric density, and neutral density. So I don't know if we should uh, maybe should ask for questions now, or uh, we can do it at, at, the, at the end. So how shall we proceed? Are there now questions from your side?
So seems not to be the case, then I would say we should uh, go on. And then I would like to ask you, Fabrizio, to give your presentation. So first of all, thank you very much, Mikhail, for the opportunity to be here talking about uh, the results of joint work group one on Jigo's days. Um, so the idea of the joint work group one, as mentioned by, by Mikhail, well, is to evaluate three-dimensional electron dense estimations and make some uh, case scenarios in which we can uh, provide some simulations to the uh, to to, to improve our understanding of how to make uh, better anasoric models in general in three dimensions. Um, but we, in the beginning, we have two directions to go or going to simulations or going to direct measurements to create a data set in which we could evaluate several uh, three dimensional electron dense modeling using the same data set as reference. It, we, this first couple of years, we went to the direction of doing a data set based on real data. So we created a, a platform in which all the members of the group can uh, evaluate their models using the same data set or make their analysis using the same data set. And there are uh, about 15 missions and instruments that the users could use with um, uh, global networks. Uh, so far, there are more than four models, uh, but completely evaluated four models uh, the, of the ionosphere that we have confronted them. Uh, they vary in the, like, they could, they can be empirical models, that there are tomography models, there are physical models, and there are machine learning methods that, as well that we are uh, evaluating there. And there are a set of examples of, um, how to use the data set and how to make the analysis in a way that we can compare the methods afterwards in, in a fair way. And the, several papers have been using this data set. Here is just four of them, uh, in which many of the, the first uh, directions of study to improve the electron dense modeling was in the direction of the plasma sphere, because if we run several models of the plasma sphere, we can see nowadays a very different pattern between what we see about the electron dense, like here is a tomography method that I have developed, Nequik, IRI plus, and they show completely different plasma sphere. That's mainly because we don't ha do not have that much observations uh, on the on that region. Uh, so there are some papers that are using this data from Van Halen probe and seeing uh, the actual distribution of the plasma sphere when you use uh, in-situ measurements over there and how they would behave in the VTEC uh, distributions as well. Uh, and all of this data from Van Halen probe are, are included in the data set and people could use it and, and, and try to understand how to improve this, um, this region of the ionosphere. And the other examples include uh, in-situ measurements from the MSP that we can compare against uh, more recent models or in the quick, for instance, uh, other work has used it here as evaluated several in situ measurements of the ionosphere in comparison to radio occultation uh, given by GNSS. And the, we have detected that there are difference, relevant difference between the measurements. So we need to uh, standardize a way to apply some coefficients to correct all the in situ measurements to the same datum, datum of the of the ionosphere, I would say. So that that's something that we wish to do in our data set nowadays to correct them to the same datum. And the other works I'm not going to detail, but uh, they are developing new models of the ionosphere based on, on the same kind of instruments that we are uh, making available. There are some works that are using swarm data and grace data to improve the assimilation schemes on TIGCN, uh, improving the way of uh, evaluating the, the, the electron dense analysis. For, for instance, in this bottom left panel, we have uh, developed a way to analyze VTEC distributions based on ionosome data, or, or which means evaluate two-dimensional distributions based on three-dimensional data. And if, 
there are many other works. I, I am not going to do this in all of them. I, the main one that I want to promote here is uh, this about the global scale transfer to more that uh, there are not many works that have done that. And I would like to encourage more people to do this and then we can confront all of the tomographs uh, using the same data set and the same input and output uh, references. So the uh, simple agenda, and I will go very briefly here, is just a motivation of why doing uh, global tomography first. So we can say that we could apply as equal as we apply global atmospheric maps nowadays from IGS, but we would not have errors due to mapping functions. So that's an uh, important um, thing for single frequency PPP, I would say, or for a high precise positioning that uh, requires some sort of uh, correction on the atmospheric delay, or, or, or also for other instruments that may need correction uh, regarding the ionosphere. So we can use uh, horizontal TC measurements. For instance, uh, we have been using only vertical uh, DC measurements, almost vertical DC measurement from GNSS. But if you want to include radio quotation data um, into the ionospheric models, we will need somehow to go to three dimensional and at global scale because this uh, signals goes for a long path uh, on the atmosphere. And the, of course, these three dimensional electronic reconstructions, they allow extracting uh, relevant information for physics of the ionosphere, like the HMF2 and MF2 and the scale high and the gradient of the scale high. The scale high would be important to convert into temperature measurements of the ionosite part of the atmosphere, which means that we can have some idea of, uh, of the mass density. So it, it be, would be important to orbit propagation. Um, and in this case that we have studied about the global scale tomography, we have used 2,700 SS stations around the world. We have uh, used mainly open source data, but not in Japan because only Japan would be almost this amount of stations. So <laughs> only Japan that we have not used the open data. And it, um, we are analyzed the sympatric geomagnetic storm, which is a relevant storm for, for the community to see if the tomograph can check uh, or detect signatures of the storm. And the, the resolution is quite high for a global scale, three-dimensional uh, tomography. It's two degrees by two degrees by 20 kilometers in, in a time resolution of 15 minutes. And it's for reference, we have used several instruments and compared to TIGCN. So when we run this tomograph, um, we have mainly detected that it's possible to, to detect the, the storm uh, influence over the ionosphere. Like for instance, in this middle panel, uh, we can check the there is a, a higher intensity of the electron density compared to the previous day, which was a quiet day on the ionosphere. But after uh, the storm day, we if you look to the next day, we can see that there is an inhibition of the ionosphere, and that that uh, has a, a reasonable explanation regarding to the uh, intensity of the electric field lines and the direction of the electric field lines and the geomagnetic field lines. But and we can see this and we can analyze it very well, actually. For instance, in this right side plot, we can check the, the, the equatorial anomaly mainly. And if we check during the stormy moments, we can see that this uh, equatorial ionization anomaly, it, it disturbs a lot. Uh, which agrees, completely agrees with the storm indexes. And he, all of these have a, a very good explanation. And just to inform you that to make this change on the electric field lines, you really need to punch very hard the ionosphere. So uh, this um, index here, almost at minus 230, of nanoteslas is quite strong for the ionosphere, and we can detect this kind of impacts on the uh, three-dimensional electrodes modeling by tomography. And if you compare these kind of uh, reconstructions against uh, high-quality data like ionoson, we see that they can show some disturbances, like the tomography results here. They show a very well. Uh, 
connect the disturbance to the ionosonde measurements, while in the other days, which are not storm days, uh, the the distributions are are more uh, harmonic, let's say, more quiet. And the, if we compare to other models, they are not capable of showing this kind of improvement or uh, uh, distributions. And the, if you if make the difference and compute the bias and the standard deviation, all of them uh, have uh, shown that, including GNSS, can prove the three-dimensional uh, uh, representation of the ionosphere with some improvement of 30%, more or less. And the, if you compare with in situ measurements from GRACE, we can see the same, that there are some disturbances on the GRACE data due to the geomagnetic storm, and the tomography can detect this kind of disturbances which were not detected in, in, in other models. And the, if you look to the incoherent scatter header, which is one of the most precise uh, measurements of the answer that we can have nowadays, we can see that tomograph uh, agrees very well in comparison to other models. And the, the same for the uh, standard deviation, bias, and, and correlation. We have improvements of around 25% of uh, tomography in comparison to other models. So as conclusion, I would just like to say that it's, it's possible to make global tomography and have a general idea of how the ionosphere is and plasma sphere, actually. Um, we have confirmed that it's possible to capture some, some signatures of the, uh, of the storms. Of course, there are limitations on that uh, tomography. And I'm very clear with them that uh, it's very, there are a lot of data gaps, so we need to, over the oceans, cover with um, background data, basically. There are comp computational efficiencies that are limited because of uh, the amount of parameters. So we need to wait a bit to increase the resolution and detect finer structures of the ionosphere. Uh, there are still relevant challenges to, with the background models that we need to improve a lot. And the real time is still not a reality. For, for this case of example, we, we have waited something like 20 to 30 minutes to have a snapshot of the ionosphere. So it's quite far from real time. Well, uh, I would like to thank all the partners and all the attendees to the conference. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Uh, so I think we should go on and have then the second uh, presentation from, from Ethan. Uh, Thank you so much, Michael and everybody. Uh, the, my name is Esan Fruten and I am trying to um, give you an overview of the work that we have done on uh, increasing the application of a space-borne measurement for predicting uh, thermospheric neutral density. Uh, as uh, Michael said that I started my uh, role as vice uh, chair of this uh, subcommission and uh, from that while the from that in, in 2019 and from that time I was quite in, inspired with the whole discussion that we had about the uh, essential variables in the in the uh, for, uh, essential geodetic variables and uh, we also kind of tried to in different uh, meetings and in different presentation to kind of promote uh, uh, our message that kind of there are also uh, related variables uh, uh, in atmosphere that we have to be uh, very careful about it. And as Michael said, that kind of this uh, total electron content or electron density and total uh, neutral density of the thermosphere or the distribution of that density are kind of variables that, that we think that it is important to be considered in the essential, as, as essential uh, geodetic variables. We also took that um, overview and kind of tried to um, run our research in that direction. So if we want to consider, for example, electron density and thermosphere density as essential variables, what we have to address. So as also uh, Harold in the, in the previous, uh, in the last hour, he was saying that basically from the kind of uh, 
use their point of view. Actually, they are not that much interested in knowing that how we compute things, but basically they would say that, okay, provide us, if you think that is an essential variable, provide us that variable, but also tell us the story of it. So say that what, what is spatial resolution that you can achieve or what is the temporal resolution of that variable, whether it is a local coverage or, or, a, or kind of global coverage needed, but how long you can go back and can you also predict what, what is happening with that variables and what is the uncertainty of all of that? So that kind of, and many other questions, but these are the main questions that we have considered when we were kind of forming our investigations in our focus area. So the part that I would like to talk about it, it is that uh, how we can actually use a space-borne uh, neutral density estimation and kind of uh, use it to provide like more global and kind of long-term uh, estimation of the density. Uh, first, I have to mention that there are different, we have like one group that are actually working on the comparison and estimation of this, uh, this uh, neutral density using the spaceborne uh, techniques. And we had a presentation that by, uh, I think by Christian Zims in the, in the last subcommission meeting in Potsdam. So I do not go in the direction of, so basically how this data is computed, but I just want to mention that, for example, through the ESA, uh, we have free data available from, from CHAMP, GRACE, and I think that uh, TU Delft has provided also GRACE follow-on. There are estimation of the uh, neutral density estimation from, from GOCHE mission, uh, also available from, from, from TU Delft. Uh, and basically, we can say that we have like uh, a bunch of data that it can be used to monitor the thermosphere, but the, we have some problem with it. The thing that I am showing in that in that animation shows that if we use that space-borne uh, kind of uh, observation of the density, we would have like uh, point-wise along track estimation. And also that uh, it means that then we do not have a global coverage. And also if you look at the orbit, so we would cover like different altitudes. So basically the altitude wise also, we do not kind of cover a constant altitude. So the question is that, that how can actually we use that data to provide an overview of the thermosphere? Uh, one could say that, okay, basically we can gather this data and stay one day and do kind of some compare uh, some some um, accounting for the different sampling time and kind of a spatial time and then use that uh, one day of for example correction or few uh, orbits of that correction for computing some corrections that is what i have done this is like one day of grace data and on the left, you see that one uh, base model and on the right, there are kind of correction that has been used is along track estimation. But the problem is that if you want to kind of ignore the physics behind uh, thermosphere variation, ionosphere variation or any type of uh, processes that we are looking for, then we would have like some problems in the in 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 our assumption. So that is like the the original model. I show it in this A and this is B. This is the scale or the correction that I have used using grace data and on C. This is the corrected model and and basically the corrected model minus the original model. I show it in D, and you will see that okay there are differences. It means show it means that if we add corrections, so we would come up with some new estimation of the density. But obviously in the in the differences there are some signals. Uh, that exists and we cannot say that this is because of the interpolation or that is the reality. So that is right that a big part of our uh, research is, is nowadays is going in the direction of basically put everything, our, our knowledge of the physical processes into the picture and try use observations and ingest these observation in these processes. From the kind of uh, application point of view, all of our uh, knowledge about the physical processes, we can assume that they are reflected in the models that we have. So therefore we can use our observation and integrate them into the models to improve those models. From that, we, we are looking at two 
different kind of techniques. One is called kind of data simulation or kind of empirical data simulation or Bayesian measures. So what is data simulation? It means that we take the observation, we use the models, we run the models, kind of ensemble of the models and use the observation to correct it. This is advantageous because if we use the observation, we can kind of push our models to our observations. If the model is more correct, the, the, the update is not that much. But if, if the model is not correct and the observation is correct, the model goes towards the observation. But we would also have some challenging problems here that because uh, we have to then decide if at one point we have some a model correction, how it can be extended globally. And then the other things that Fabrizio was telling that in that case also there are some uh, caution that it should be considered for the forecasting because uh, through the time that we have the observation, we can correct the model. And now we have to kind of decide whether that forecasting with that uh, model that has a better state would make sense or not. Another approach that we can consider is cal called simultaneous calibration and data simulation. It means that, okay, we have a model, we have a knowledge, the model has some parameters. We try that kind of sequentially, not only improve the model states, but also select few parameters and calibrate those parameters. Why we do that? Because we say that, okay, we have used that model for a long time, basically, it, it should have made some sense, that model. But that model has some parameters which not, might not be very useful for nowadays pr prediction or for, for the future prediction. So we can rely on the model and the model parameters, but use the observation to kind of tune the model parameters for, for the current date. Then trust the, the model parameters and use it for the future. So if we state like calibration data simulation, it means that we can sequentially either improve the model states and the model parameters together, or we can say that, okay, we do not need even model state, we just uh, calibrate the parameters. So it gives kind of different type of uh, freedom to, ap to apply such approaches. If we were able to select good parameters and we could successfully uh, calibrate those parameters, then we would have the advantage, the, the advantage that we can basically use those parameters to simulate everything globally. And then also we can at least uh, rely on those parameters to predict something in the near, fu near future. Uh, well, the kind of the concept is quite a straightforward, but kind of when you go through the application, it is kind of uh, a lot of choices should be done. Some of them are kind of technically, some of them are application dependent. And I just kind of list what, uh, what it came to my mind to give you an impression. So why actually a bunch of researchers needed to do that kind of research. So we, we talk about the knowledge it, the knowledge of the physical processes, it means that we have to come up with the choice of model. The model can be empirical, it can be physical. We can say that which type of observation to be integrated to, to the model, it can be thermosphere related, ionosphere more re related, and the multi-sensor. Each of them have some advantages and kind of also kind of technical issues come. So if you say multi-sensor, do you want to rely, re, rely more on the thermosphere observation or on the ionosphere observation? Thermosphere measurements and thermosphere processes are kind of more, uh, 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 more kind of uh, global and, 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 and larger scale and ionosphere electron might, might be kind of more locally changing. So there are also kind of differences in, in, the, in the kind of spatial uh, and temporal sensitivity. You have to come up with the choice of the method. As I say, you can use the data simulation, calibration data simulation, how to, these things can be imp implemented. Then some application related, whether we want to do it now casting, forecasting, which variable we want to now cast or forecast and how, to, how, do, how we would like to implement all of this. 
So I just provide a very brief overview of what exists in our hand and we look at it. So we have like empirical models. There are many of them and this uh, NLMCs type of model uh, from, from the US or uh, JB 2008 and this uh, and kind of some data deriving models can be used as an empirical basis. The benefit of that is that uh, these models kind of are empirically driven. It means that it is like one can consider it as, as, as a collection of uh, polynomials and, and, and mathematical function. For this, we need, we need to have some model coefficients. So basically those model coefficients should should be updated using the new observations. Uh, we had also physics-based models. It means that the model considered the physical processes has differential equation in it. It requires to have the model states uh, and re require initial values. Then one can kind of improve the initial values or the model state and, and, and try model to kind of uh, to integrate or, or or account for the interaction between different variables. Well, each of them could have like their benefits and problems. The empirical models are easy to use, but they do not account for the coupling processes so sophisticated. Uh, but coupled models are sophisticated in the in the physics, but it is very difficult uh, to integrate things in them because you might improve something and come up with destroying something else. So I would like to show some of the experiments that we have done and then uh, a kind of a quick uh, a result show, showing the, uh, quickly what, what we have achieved so far. So in most of the cases, we consider uh, a sequential data simulation approach in even if you use empirical model or a physical model, and is that that we can come up with the ensemble of the model outputs that I show it here. I do not go into the details how we come up with it. Then at the time that we have the ensemble of the model outputs, we have the observation. We try to use this, this observation with, with its uncertainty to improve the model estimates. So at the step later, we would come up with the model estimates or update, which is more accurate than observation and the model. And then we start from the new, new stage and, and, and go further. If I just use this observation to improve the model stage, I call it data simulation. If I use it for the model uh, state improvement plus the calibration, I would call it calibration data simulation. So one of the things that I was talking about, for example, is that we have a point voice measurement uh, or a long track measurement, which has to be used to improve a global model. For this, I have to decide how this measurement uh, can influence the model. So for that, I have to use localization. It means that I have to say that uh, which radius that measurement should, should, should improve. Uh, on, 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 a, on a certain altitude or how, how vertically it should influence. There are different choices. If I, if I have a smaller uh, localization, then, then I would locally change things. And if it is more global, uh, you would change all the, all the global values of, of the variable. We have, been, we have done different experiences using the physical models the different choices has been selected for the localization and how to integrate. And we can see that in, in uh, with like selecting an ensemble and kind of uh, some realistic localization, we actually change, we can change the physical model and uh, show that that update globally. But the problem that we have is that the quality of the uh, quality of the prediction in those cases. So this is an experiment that we have done in that St. Patrick's uh, storm in 2015. We have used this storm C data as observation and tried to validate it with, 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 the, with the storm A and storm B. 
And we see that if you run a, a um, physical model, that is the typical things that you see during the storm time, you cannot pick, you cannot uh, detect the peaks uh, very, very well. And also it is very difficult to kind of, uh, to detect the phase that, that the storm is calming down. So if you see that in all of the cases that the black color is the original model and the red color is the, observation, uh, sorry, the green color is the observation and the red color is the analysis. Analysis is mean that in the period that I have fitted the model to the observation and the blue color is a prediction. It means that I, now I uh, rely on the model and try to predict the, the future with the model. And as you see that in, in all the three cases, the blue colors, they do not have that much fit to the observation, or at least we lose uh, uh, some of the accuracy. So it is absolutely better than the original model, but it cannot really match the observations in the prediction. This is kind of motivated us to, to use the, an empirical model and look at the application, because if if, as you said, if you are looking for the essential variables, you want to have kind of uh, some spatial uh, multi-level data, and you, you, are, you want to be able to predict it very well. So that might be kind of a good idea, not now be concerned about the physics that much, but kind of focus on how we can predict this certain variable well. So that is, why that we have used uh, the data from the grays from, from CHAMP and, and, and so on, and tune these uh, measurements, uh, merge these measurements in that empirical model NRLM since 2000. The approach that we have used is calibration data simulation. It means that we use the measurement to update few parameters of that empirical model sequentially, once we can, once we update those parameters and we run the mod, the models with that new parameters for 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 a few hours, and then we see that whether we can predict the same tracks or the tracks that we have not used before. This is an example that uh, I have uh, I I have implemented in that in a, in a paper in for the scientific report. So considering one month of the data in, in February 2015. And it shows that if you use, for example, SOARM data and use NLMCs as a basis, the, in that month we have different kind of uh, solar uh, geomagnetic activities and the solar activity so is more or less also variable, but, but it is not including a cycle changes in it. It shows that if we do that calibration data simulation, since the empirical model is easier to deal with, it, it, we, we, could, we could derive a, a very, very nice fit, even in the forecasting. And I will show some comparison later in that St. Patrick day uh, in, in the next slides. So, so far what I show that if I introduce a long track uh, measurement, I can improve the along track uh, uh, estimation and even in the forecasting period. So I can forecast one, one hour up to one day if I, I, I implement that C, uh, calibration data simulation. But the question is whether this correction is only a long track or it has well distributed globally. So that is now I show that kind of uh, the latitude dependent time series which on, you have the um, original model on the left and the observations on the right. And this is kind of in the middle is the improved model. So it means that if the improved model is more closer to the observation, so we have done something well. So that it shows that at least uh, visually it can even be, be seen that that corrections, uh, the new model is, is kind of uh, uh, well corresponding to the, to the observation. One thing that you should consider here, so that is for B, it is altitude of 500. Um, Isan, and, yeah? sorry, sorry that I interrupt you, but could you please come to an end because yes. we're totally running out of time now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And for the swarm C, that's also the same thing. 
we can see that the whole uh, updates, the, the, the product that we can produce, it, is, it, can, be, uh, it can be generated globally and on multi-level. We have tested that kind of uh, approach. If we in, improve the density, can we see the application in the, in the ionosphere uh, predictions? And we see that if we in, improve the uh, density, put it in a physical model and then estimate uh, ionosphere variables, actually we can come up with the uh, ionosphere uh, variability that is closer to the observation. So in that result, I show kind of a global, uh, uh, global comparisons of the uh, new estimation of the electron density compared to the radio occultation studies. Uh, I just come to, to the one slide I just want to show. So this was very interesting for us. That's why we, gave, we came to the discussion with, uh, with, uh, uh, with ESA under, a swarm, uh, under the SWARM DISC program. And then we decided to look at how we can use this space-borne measurement for, for, for producing global uh, density fields. And for this, we have looked at, for example, seven uh, different storm cases and apply that uh, uh, one original CDA approach without changing and to see that whether we are able to produce the reality. And this is a kind of a comparisons, at least for one of these cases so this that I showed before. On the bottom, that is the result that we had from for the, uh, uh, for the physical based data assimilation. And that is on the top, it is that empirical calibration data assimilation. And uh, different investigation that we have done, it, it, it shows that basically we can use that type of approach to produce global multi-level density models. So I come to the final uh, slide. From our findings and from our research progress, uh, we have found that there are different choices that we, uh, we can pursue to, 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 to use, to, to make use of a space-borne density estimations and the electron density estimation uh, to, provide the, to provide the variables. But as I said, that there are many technical issues in it. So then we are kind of continuously investigated all of these uh, choices. Thanks for your uh, attention, and I'm sorry that I ran a bit longer. Okay, thank you very much. So, are there uh, questions now? So, then uh, I think we should uh, go to the coffee break now. That means uh, quarter to 10 minutes to 11, um, up to 10, uh, yeah, 10 minutes to 11, we have now our coffee break. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so I think it's time uh, to continue. So um, welcome uh, to the DPS meeting. So this is uh, the schedule uh, is like, like this, so I will start with an uh, overview on the activities of the Bureau of Products and Standards. And then we will have a presentation by Urs Martin, which will be given remotely. And unfortunately, uh, Mike Thomas uh, is not able to participate in the Vigo space. Uh, so he asked me to give his presentation. And um, then at the end, we will have a presentation on the definition of essential geodetic uh, variables. And uh, so we hope that we will have uh, also time for discussions at the end, because I think this is uh, in particular regarding the essential geodetic variables, I think it's important to use the opportunity here to, to discuss this topic. So this is uh, uh, the presentation on the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. Um, I First, I would like uh, to thank uh, the co-authors here of this presentation. So these are the members of the BPS. And uh, this uh, 
or similar view graph has already been shown uh, during several meetings, but uh, I would just like uh, to get a brief overview in particular for, for those who uh, are not very familiar with the activities of the Bureau of Products and Standards. Uh, a key objective is to support GIGOS uh, to provide consistent results describing the ge geometry, rotation, and gravity, gravity field of the Earth, which is, of course, essential for uh, Earth system studies and for uh, monitoring uh, global change or climate change phenomena such as uh, sea level rise. Uh, this is uh, illustrated here also in the figure. You see here the key objectives of uh, of the BPS. So the first one is on uh, coordination uh, activities regarding the homogenization of IAG standards and product. The second is on the evaluation of uh, standards and conventions, and this will be uh, addressed in more detail in this presentation. Uh, another uh, activity is the stimulation uh, of the development of new geodetic products. Uh, which are needed for our sciences and society. And I think this is really an important, important issue to make geodesy more visible. And I will also address in more detail uh, the last item on the description and promotion of geodetic products uh, also related to uh, GIGOS outreach activities. So this is the uh, organizational structure of uh, of the BPS, it is shared by the Technical University of Munich, but we, uh, as you see here in, uh, in the uh, list of staff members, we have also, also uh, Robert Heinkelmann from the GFZ Potsdam uh, included in the team and also Peter Steigenberger from the uh, German Aerospace uh, Center DLR. The GIGOS components have already been shown on the, on the very first slide. Uh, so I don't want to repeat it here. Uh, the work of the Bureau of Products and Standards um, requires a lot of interactions uh, within IAG, with the IAG services, but also with other entities involved in standards and uh, conventions and, and products. And so uh, we have uh, quite a number of representatives uh, of the IAG services and other entities involved in this topic, with, which is shown here in this uh, slide. So in the first part, uh, you see the representatives uh, from the uh, geometric services. These are mainly the uh, analysis coordinators. Then uh, the next block shows the representatives um, of the gravity community. And in, in green, uh, the rep uh, representatives from other entities, for example, the International Astronomical Union. And uh, there is uh, still written to be defined, but I think we are very close to a solution. So I uh, talked with uh, Jose Ferrandis, and he will most probably be the person who will be act, uh, acting as a representative uh, here. And I think this is a very good solution to further strengthen the interaction between GIGOS and the IAU. Uh, so this um, view graph uh, shows in, in more detail the interaction with the external, uh, within IAG and the external stakeholders. Uh, so as I mentioned, the IAG services, they uh, have uh, defined their uh, representatives, mainly the analysis coordinators. And uh, we have a very strong interface uh, between the BPS and the IES Convention Center, so in both directions. Nick uh, Stamatakos acts as the IES representative to the BPS, and uh, I act as the representative from the BPS to the IES. And uh, as I mentioned already, uh, Jose will be most probably the person who will act uh, as the representative to the BPS, and Robert Heinkelmann is the representative from the BPS to the IAU. So I think we have a very good uh, interaction also there. Concerning the International Standards Organization, ISO, we have also uh, interaction in both directions. And concerning the UNGGM Subcommittee on Geodesy and the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence, 
Um, I uh, have been nominated as the IAG representative to the subcommittee uh, on geodesy for the working group data sharing and development of standards. And uh, I think it would be also important that we define a representative uh, from uh, the subcommittee on geodesy or the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence uh, to act as a representative to the BPS so that we have also here the interaction in both directions. So this uh, slide shows the BPS Im implementation plan for the years 20, uh, 20 uh, until 2022. Uh, this is, um, you see here three main uh, parts. So the first one is uh, here on top on communication and coordinating uh, activities. So these are regular meetings here and uh, we have quite a lot of, of uh, meetings to uh, perform the uh, communication and coordination activities. And the main, the main work in principle is done here in the second block here uh, labeled with a specific task on products and standards. And then we have a third part here uh, related to outreach activities. And I will, uh, on the next slide, I will some show some examples on the present work. Uh, one remark here. So uh, you see here that uh, uh, there's a unified analysis workshop and GIGOS days 2021 uh, are, are shown. So this was uh, the plan when we were writing this, but uh, as you all know, this has to be postponed uh, and took place this year. So we have some shift here also as well. So we have to adopt this uh, according to the uh, uh, COVID situation. Um, this gives just a summary on the work uh, which we did uh, concerning the evaluation of numerical uh, uh, of, of standards used for the generation of IAG products. So we um, have um, compiled an uh, inventory uh, which was uh, published in the IAG handbook, uh, uh, in Ge Geodesis handbook 2016 and an updated version in the uh, Geodesis Handbook 2020. Uh, you see here the contents of, of this inventory. Uh, so um, a, a, short in, a short introduction in the topics then an overview on the GIGOS Bureau of Products and Standards. And then uh, chapter uh, three uh, addresses the topic according to numerical standards. This will be addressed in a few slides uh, uh, later. And uh, a key focus in this inventory is the product-based uh, review. And here we uh, evaluated six geodetic products, which are so shown here on the, on the right. And these are typical, uh, let's say, the primary geodetic products. And we are uh, considering also to uh, extend this inventory to consider other products and uh, in the... Uh, presentation before before the break, uh, it was shown that a lot of work has been done in the field of atmosphere. So these are uh, uh, some products which are also considered to be included in the extend, extended version. But we are also thinking about further products to uh, uh, which where geodesy plays an important role, but which involves also other communities such as sea level or ice melting or terrestrial water storage. But I think this is really important to think in this direction to, to get a better interaction also with other disciplines and to make geodesy more visible. The idea of the inventory is to assess the present status, to identify gaps and deficiencies, and to provide recommendations uh, for further improvements to increase the consistency of the geodetic products. And this, of course, uh, requires interaction with several entities, which has been shown uh, in, several, in the slide before already. But now I, in the following, I would uh, shortly uh, uh, address the topic of uh, numerical standards um, and uh, the BPS activities related to, to this topic. And this topic was uh, uh, 
addressed during uh, the unified analysis workshop, which took uh, place in October this year, so just a few weeks ago. And in the framework of the unified analysis workshop, there was a special session on standards, conventions, and formats. And this session was organized by uh, Nick Stamakos uh, of the IES Convention Centers and by myself. So this clearly demonstrates also the close interaction between BPS and IES Convention Centers. The focus of this session was on the updating of the IES conventions. We had five presentations on various uh, chapters and topics of the IES conventions, very fruitful discussions. But here in the following, I would uh, focus on chapter one, uh, which contains uh, two sections. Uh, so one on permanent height and the second one on numerical standards. So this uh, uh, just a brief overview on the uh, some facts and the present status concerning the per uh, permanent height. Uh, so we have to deal with the basic fact that the ITF coordinates are given in the conventional type three system. Gravity field models are given either in the type three or in the zero type system. And uh, the, the same holds also for the gravity potential. The gravity potential cannot be computed in the mean type system. And as we heard already in, in the morning session by, by Laura, uh, the uh, international height reference system uh, pre, uh, prescribes the coordinates in the mean type, mean type system. So this is also an IAG resolution from 2015. And uh, the mean time, mean time system has been selected for the definition of the heights to support oceanographic and hydrographic uh, modeling, uh, which is essential for monitoring global change phenomena, such as, for example, sea level rise. I think I don't need to go in detail concerning the principles. So this figure was also shown by Laura already and was also discussed this morning. And uh, so, and, and uh, the good thing here is that there is a solution for the, uh, treatment of the uh, height coordinates. Uh, this uh, has been uh, defined already very well. And uh, there is a paper written by uh, Laura and, and many other colleagues regarding the strategy for the realization of the international height reference system. And this is uh, shown here in the, in the next slide. Uh, we... Uh, uh, have to take into account that the ITF coordinates are given in the conventional type three system. So there are in principle this uh, two options depending on the definition of the, of the gravity field. And all the formulas here which are needed for the transformation to get uh, the, the heights in the mean time system are, are given here. So everything is there. It's, it's, it is a rather complicated topic, but uh, the basis is, is there, and uh, I also would like to mention uh, Jako Mekinen, who, who did a lot of work uh, to, uh, to define the strategy, and here again, the paper of uh, Laura and, and uh, other colleagues is uh, displayed here. So now I come to the numerical standards. Uh, so this slide is rather busy. Uh, I don't want to uh, go in, into much detail here. I just would like to mention that uh, many different organizations or entities are involved concerning the numerical standards. For example, CoData, the Committee for, for Data in uh, Sciences and Technology, also the International Astronomical Union, uh, then the ephemeris for uh, planetary and luma, lunar ephemeris are involved. The uh, standards from Groten uh, 2004 are displayed here and also resolutions uh, of the different entities have to be considered. And just a brief summary. So uh, um, regarding the updating of the IES conventions and in particular of this uh, table 1.1, several new developments have to be taken into to account. Uh, such also as uh, new resolutions by IAU and IAG. And so here, 
the, the most important changes that are proposed by the uh, BPS are dis displayed. Uh, now, just uh, a brief overview on the on the current status, which we, we uh, still have concerning numerical standards. Uh, we still have the uh, geodetic reference system uh, 80 as the official conventional uh, uh, basis for, for the numerical standards. The values are given here in the uh, IES conventions in table 1.2. And so the table here in the middle is taken from the uh, BPS inventory uh, and this clearly indicates that we have different sources for the numerical standards and that we also have some quite large deviations here for, for example, for the uh, major uh, semi major axis A, but there are also other discrepancies and also uh, it has to be considered that the values are given in, in different uh, type systems or uh, also related to different time systems. So this makes the situation rather complicated. So the geodetic work is based on different numerical standards. A unique set of numerical standards does not exist and also time and tight systems are used differently with an ILG. And uh, the, the problem in this context is that these inconsistencies are a potential source of errors when combining different products. And towards this aim, uh, the GIGOS working group has been established uh, labeled towards a consistent set of parameters for the definition of a new geodetic reference systems. And we will uh, get more information in, in, on this uh, in the presentation by Urs Marti, which will be directly given after my presentation. This uh, slide summarizes the recommendations which we have. So concerning sec section 1.1, permanent types, an issue is to include uh, the latest developments concerning the heights. And uh, there the question is, uh, uh, how, uh, how should this be included in the IES conventions? Because uh, it's not a typical topic for the IES conventions. They are more related to geometry. And, uh, but I, I would re recommend that at least a short paragraph or a footnote should be uh, added to the IES. IES conventions to summarize the strategy to give the relevant publications and so on, that, so that there is a uh, link between geometry and the heights as well. So this would be my recommendation, but this of course needs to be discussed also within the IES. Then the recommendation on sec uh, section 1.2 is uh, that uh, uh, this uh, table 1.1 needs to update it with uh, regarding the latest developments and uh, also the uh, new references have to be provided. I like to point out here two general recommendations. So the first one I think is really important uh, that the used numerical standards, including also the time and tight systems must be clearly documented for all geodetic products. So this, I think, is really important that we don't uh, combine apples and, and peers, and it's also important for the users. They need to know where the products refer to. And the second recommendation, uh, so this topic has been discussed already during the un unified, unified analysis workshop, and it has been reformulated slightly. Uh, so now the, the focus is on uh, that the necessity of a new geodetic reference system needs to be uh, further cl clarified and discussed. And so I think we could, could have some discussion on this after the presentation given by Urs Marti. So now I come uh, to the geodetic products. Uh, you have uh, seen yesterday already uh, in the presentation given by, uh, by Martin and also by Basara that the products are classified according uh, to uh, the geodetic themes and also according to the earth system components. Uh, I don't want to repeat, repeat this here. Uh, and uh, I just would like to show here uh, shortly the list of uh, geodetic products, which has been uh, uh, published at the GIGOS website so far. 
So it's in total 23 products, which are here classified according to the uh, geodetic themes. And for each of this product, we uh, formulated somehow uh, so-called appetizer questions uh, to uh, address more focus on the product. So maybe some ex examples for the celestial reference frame. So the question, how can we link earth and space or sea level change? How fast is the sea level rising? So the intention is to, to address more attention on the, on the products. Just as an example, uh, so uh, the key product of the order of the Odyssey are the terrestrial reference frames, and uh, so this uh, product uh, description here has been uh, also included on the ITF uh, website. Um, and uh, maybe this uh, statistic here is all, uh, also interesting. Uh, so uh, what? was really surprising for me if we look at the visits for the different products, uh, uh, the earth orientation parameters are on place two. It's before the reference frames. And this was really surprising for me. This is a clear indication that the earth orientation parameters are also very interesting for people outside of geodesy, I would assume. And I think sea surface heights is not very surprising because uh, sea level rising is everywhere in the in the social media and uh, so. So on this slide, I have some uh, final remarks. So the first is really important. Without the uh, fundamental support of the IAG services and uh, the other IAG components, the work of GIGOS would, would not be possible. So this is really the foundation. Uh, and the second item uh, uh, shows in principle one of the key goals, uh, and this is the evaluation of geodetic uh, standards and uh, conventions uh, towards the development of consistent uh, products. And uh, the work uh, which we have done regarding the description, uh, the classification and description of products is, uh, goes in the direct to, direction to make the products easier findable and to make geodesy more visible to other disciplines and to society. And this was done uh, uh, through a very good uh, uh, collaborative work between the BPS, the GIGOS coordinating office, the GIGOS science panel, and uh, the IAG services and other data providers. And this really, I would like to not acknowledge here. And uh, another important issue is that I think with such an information platform, uh, we, we can provide a central access point for geodetic uh, products. And uh, GIGOS, in this way, GIGOS can contribute to make geodesy more visible uh, for its beneficial products. And then the last item, uh, so I think the classification and description of geodetic products could also be a, a first step towards the definition of essential geodetic variables. And this topic, I think we should then discuss later after the presentation given by, by Richard Ross. So now I have a final slide related to outreach activities. So uh, outreach or to make geodesy more visible was the uh, uh, motivation for this uh, book project, uh, Mission Earth, Geodynamics and Climate Change Observed Through Satellite Geodesy. And for all those who are interested, so there is one book, it's just on the table here outside. So you can, you can have a look and uh, 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 just one additional information uh, since a few weeks, also the book, uh, the book in, in Dutch is available now. And, uh, this looks different. The Dutch version is much more illustrated. So in particular, the historical development of geodesy is with very, very nice figures. Also the topic climate change is with very impressive pictures. So it's a, a, a very well pictured book, the, the Dutch version. Okay, thanks. That's all what I have. Any questions or comments?
Okay, if, if not, we can directly continue with the presentation by Urs Martin. I'm sorry, um, Detlef already gave a little bit of status, what is now the, the current status of the GRS. So we still have the GRS-80 as the, our conventional global reference system. GRS-80, that means 1980, so that means it is 42 years old. And the data that are behind are even older, that's from the 1970s. And just a reminder, that was the pre-GPS area. So uh, a lot of knowledge we know, now have was not integrated or not considered in the GRS-80. Also at that time, permanent tide systems, they were not really an important issue and they are not treated at all in GRS-80. Now a little bit, uh, what complicates the situation even more is that we now have, since 2015, the new conventional value of the W0, and that was adopted by IAG. Of course, this new W0, as we heard from Laura, was the main purpose was the definition of the international height reference system. And GRS80 W0 was a derived quantity out of other parameters. So, of course, we have differences that go into the decimeter level. Also, the terrestrial time, it's not defined on neither of those two W0 values. So we have discrepancies, we learn to live with them, but uh, certainly it's not a very satisfying situation. With time, we could estimate new values. They went into the IRS conventions, especially values for the gravitational, uh, um, uh, geocentric gravitational constant, also for the flattening, J2 or C20, whatever you want for the semi-major axis, and of course, what I said already, the W0. Today, of course, we can observe, let's say, many of these parameters by space techniques, and we have better values than we could introduce in the GRS-80. And what's also possible today is the monitoring of temporal changes, they, there are long-term changes and there are seasonal uh, uh, changes. And of course, as also Detlef said already, there's a very inconsistent treatment of the permanent tide yeah. systems. So this working group was defined, uh, was established to define a new consistent, uh, consistent set of parameters and formulas uh, to be used in geodesy in the in general in earth scientists sciences we should go for a proper treatment of the permanent tide systems take into account relativistic effects and then what is important is the study of the necessity of replacing grs80 as a conventional system that is a big discussion. And another discussion, I will not uh, go to, into it further today, is if we need a conventional global gravity field model, satellite only model, combined model to be used by standard users that they don't want to, to go uh, to all the models that are available today and select one at the ICGM uh, website, let's say. So the definition of, the G of a GRS, so we have four independent parameters that we can determine. For a new GRS, we chose uh, W0, which was adopted by IAG 2015 then some kind of flattening, J2, C2, 0, whatever. 
the geocentric gravitational constant and uh, the uh, Earth rotation. Uh, yeah. And all the other parameters will be derived quantities, especially I want to mention the semi major axis A, which is classically always used as a defining const, uh, constant in earlier um, global reference systems. Also, an IHG resolution is the zero tide system as a conventional tidal systems. But what we have to perform uh, for sure is transformations to the other uh, systems that are available. Then how to treat time dependency. All defining parameters are time dependent, but uh, it would be too confusing and let's say too difficult to properly treat this, uh, this uh, time dependency. So we decided that a new GRS will be uh, designated for a certain reference epoch. And for now, we choose the epoch 2010. That is the value of, uh, uh, that's the epoch of the adopted value of the W0 as it was defined in the IAG resolution of 2015. Calculation of the parameters, the formulas and procedures are basically uh, well known. So we have the, the procedures by Moritz for the definition of GRS-80. We have the pub, uh, publications of uh, Groten, 2004 who for the last time calculated such a set of parameters. And then we have newer work by, uh, let's say, uh, Jakob Mekinen mainly about the permanent tide system and also about the treatment of uh, relativistic effects. A preliminary calculation was mainly performed by Ilya Oshepkov. So he had, he built up this uh, new, uh, set of parameters and derived quantities that we are will base uh, our the final calculations. A more difficult question is, should we calculate this new uh, set of parameters? In my opinion, yes. So we really want to know what are the best estimate values and what would be the consequences of using them. But we can calculate them, but should we also replace the GRS-80 as conventional system as we use them? In favor of that, this, uh, there are arguments uh, in favor of it, so we could uh, we can perform. Because we cannot see your screen anymore. Uh, yeah. It was yeah. stopped. I, yeah, it, somehow it was an interruption. Yes, now you should see it again. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, there are some arguments in favor of uh, replacing GRS-80. So really, we are nearer to the parameters that are more consistent with the real or actual system Earth. And we could bring into consistency the, all these discrepancies that are, were mentioned by uh, Detlef before between GRS-80, IRS conventions, and uh, other uh, quantities. But there are also some severe disadvantages if we uh, replace GRS-80. There's, of course, a danger of confusion between coordinates, let's say, or gravity values or whatever, in which system they are given. And also, that means a lot of work, adoption of uh, software packages and applications. 
then of course we would have again to change conventions and standards, not only in geodesy, but in road science. And of course, all data sets change. So as examples, I mentioned here, ellipsoid coid, it coordinates, ellipsoidal heights, gravity, anomalies, mean sea surface and derived uh, geoid models and so on. What are the consequences if we stay with GRS-80? In principle, we can do that. We can, could do it until now. We can continue to do it. But uh, of course, this, all these inconsistencies that exist today will continue. But also it's illusional to think that if we introduce a new GRS, that all users will immediately change to it. So GRS safety will be around for a rather long time uh, still. That means that we also have to provide transformation parameters and methods to uh, transform data sets, anomalies, whatever, from GRS-80 to a new GRS. And perhaps even to, to other systems that use the IRS convention values, EGM 2008 is in another uh, reference system and so on. These are my recommendations. I think it's worse that we calculate a consistent set of parameters of a new GRS-80 based on currently available data and observations. And what we have to do is provide transformation methods to from GRS-80. But the important step is check the willingness to, of users to adopt a new GRS. And then the final step will to adopt the new GRS and update all the conventions and standards. But in any case, Detlef said it also already, that we need clear documentation of applied standards and convention for all the existing data sets. Of course, I can also uh, start with the questions I have to you. Are there additional arguments for a new GRS or against the introduction of a new GRS? And another thing, okay, I didn't uh, go into detail today. Do we need a conventional Earth gravity model? For many applications, I would say we don't need it, but uh, I think in any case, but we should recommend one for users that are not directly involved but, uh, in, uh, in uh, gravity field determination let's say that's like that like civil aviation military applications that we should design this uh, designate one model uh, the, the normal user should uh, use that's all from my part thank you Okay, thank you Chris, for this uh, nice overview and for, for some important questions. And so I would directly like to ask for, for comments. I think uh, we have already confusion between between the two ellips uh, ellipsoids used presently. This is GRS 80 and WGS 84. Uh, I know that the uh, user of uh, the um, um, Global Gravity Model Service at GFZ uh, have always problems to, to get the geoid heights referring to the WGS84 or GLS80, because the difference between both the results are more or less uh, 91 centimeters or 
or something in this. Hi. <laughs> or something at this level and um, it, 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 the, the first problem we have in the Colorado experiment is that some colleagues uh, use w, uh, w, um, w, uh, the, the, this, uh, w ES84 yes. uh, ellipsoid uh, for the computation of, of the fit solutions so it, it was not clear that the GRS80 is the Presently, official recommendation of IEG for the for the ellipsoid. So probably with a new ellipsoid, could we solve these these discrepancies in, in the computation uh, of the geoid for practical uses? Uh, sorry, I, I don't hear the questions now. Okay, so was you didn't understand my question or my comment, and you under you understood the question raised by by Laura. I heard uh, I heard Laura very well. I didn't okay. hear anything else. Now I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Very good. Yeah. So uh, my question was: uh, Was do you have any comment on on that? Was Laura was mentioning? Oh yeah, that's okay. We have this small difference between GRS80 and WGS84. Okay, that's tenth of a millimeter in uh, minor, uh, semi-minor axis. Uh, it is a small discrepancy that exists, but uh, okay, it's not really a big uh, issue, I think. Yeah, you... really, the, the the value of GN is. Yeah, okay. The high, GM. And in this way, you get another values for the geoid heights. Yeah, that's that's another issue. Uh, it's not just the geometry, it's the GM. Okay, that's that's uh, that's yeah, a problem. For geometry, yes. it's okay, but but for the geoid determination, yeah, no, the GM, GM is really a problem that we should resolve. And there are newer values than they were used in GR safety. And uh, of course, that's one th one one main problem of the of the inconsistencies is GM value. So your question, uh, whether the users would accept the change. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. So if the users accept the change of the ITRF every six years, 2008, 2014, 2020, why shouldn't they accept the change of the geodetic reference system all 45 years? Yeah, that's what I said, because of the change of uh, standards. So you have the ITRF, 
basically in geocentric Cartesian coordinates, and then you transform them into ellipsoidal coordinates. That's what most users do and use. And that's not just, just a standard procedure. If we change the dimensions of the ellipsoid, that's one uh, obstacle more to be accepted. Okay, any other comments or questions? So this is not the case. So thanks again, Urs. And so we can uh, continue with the next presentation, which we be given by Mike Graf. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so as I mentioned already, Mike uh, Thomas is not uh, able, uh, able to participate in, in the Shigos days, unfortunately. Uh, and so he, he prepared a, a few slides on, on his committee on contributions to Earth system modeling. And he asked me to, to present this. And I will try my best. I'm not an expert in Earth system modeling, uh, but let's, let's see. So, um, this slide gives an overview about the purpose and goals of the Earth uh, System Modeling uh, Committee. And uh, a key ob objective is to promote the development of physically consistent numerical Earth system models, which should be applicable to all geodetic parameter types. That means for geometry, gravity, and Earth, uh, Earth rotation. And uh, Two uh, key, key goals are here, uh, a deeper understanding of system processes and uh, the establishment of a link between geodetic products and process models, as well as the preparation of geodetic products for interdisciplinary utilization. Um, the second item, the link between uh, geodetic uh, products in this context, is it, it is an important issue to uh, ensure conservation of uh, mass, energy, and uh, mom uh, momentum between the different models. And this is not uh, always the case uh, right now. So this is an important topic. Concerning item three, uh, the preparation of geodetic products for utilization, I will show an ex example uh, for South America on uh, terrest terrestrial water uh, storage. And uh, to achieve this, this goal, uh, various issues have to be uh, considered. And important is the cons uh, consideration of relationships between surface deformation, earth rotation, and gravity field variations. And also, of course, the interactions uh, between, this, uh, between the subsystems of our Earth. Uh, the second item uh, addresses here uh, the uh, request from Mike that uh, uh, homogeneous uh, geophysical model should be used uh, for, for the processing of the uh, geodetic observations in an improved an analysis. Uh, so this is an important issue because we have now a very high accuracy level of the space geodetic uh, observations and uh, to really fully benefit from this high accuracy, it is also important uh, that we, uh, we use the best available models for the background models for the processing of the data. And this is also an important issue to achieve the high accuracy requirements formulated by IAG and GIGOS. So I think the uh, geophysical models ploy play a really important uh, role in this context. The work of uh, this uh, committee uh, should also contribute to inter uh, improved interpretation. And uh, of course, it, it could also um, um, uh, contribute to predictions, for example, for the Earth orientation parameters and uh, to the consistent integration of geodetic observations by applying, by applying uh, data assimilation techniques is another important topic, which could serve then as a, a test tool for validation and consistency tests of geodetic products. 
So uh, the primary uh, activities of the um, committee focused on uh, on two issues, which are shown here. So the first one is the the uh, development of interfaces uh, to geodetic observations based on data assimilation and the application of artificial intelligence algorithms. And the second item uh, is related to three-dimensional approach, uh, approaches uh, in uh, numerical, uh, advanced numerical system models uh, to consider effects due to surface ma mass loading and self-attraction. And uh, some examples are, are mentioned uh, uh, here. Uh, and in, in the following, I uh, have uh, one example for item two. So the impact of uh, three-dimensional uh, dimensional structures of the Earth's crust and mantle on, uh, mantle on loading, uh, on tidal loading response. And uh, the second example, which I will uh, show thus, just in a few minutes, is on uh, the last item, uh, on the combination of numerical model components with newly developed algorithms for artificial intelligence. So now coming uh, to the first example, uh, this is a rather uh, complete Topic in uh, in particular for for me. So I uh, also had a, a Zoom meeting with Mike to get some background in, information on on this, because I'm not very familiar with this with this uh, topic. Uh, the, it's a really new research uh, topic also within this committee on Earth System Modeling, and uh, the question behind is. Uh, so what, what is the impact of uh, unelasticity, uh, unelasticity and lateral heterogeneities uh, in the upper mantle on uh, self-attraction and loading? And what is the feedback of this on global ocean tides? And uh, Mike uh, presented here uh, an, an example uh, for the... Um, semi journal M2 uh, tide. So uh, the M2 tide uh, is the, uh, there the uh, structural vari variations of the upper mantle are, uh, are expressed quite, quite visible. And so he uh, displayed here this, this uh, figure on for the M2 uh, oscillation system. And the simulations here are by, based on a, a rotated grid, which, which you can uh, see here. And uh, the idea of the rotated grid is uh, to uh, avoid singularity at the uh, polar regions. Uh, so, and another advantage of this uh, rotated grid is to save computation time. And so the idea is to uh, locate the North and South Pole uh, in, the, in the continents. So the North Pole here is in China and the South Pole in Argentina. This is a simple uh, transfer, transformation, like a coordinate transformation. And there are great advantages for, for the modeling. And other, other uh, features here of the, of the ocean model are, are displayed here. And now I, I uh, uh, come to the major result. So uh, if the uh, unelasticity and the lateral heterogeneous of, of the mantle are, are considered, this uh, leads to an improvement of self-attraction and loading. Uh, you see that the magnitude is not very large. So it's below, below one, one millimeter but you see a high correlation between the spatial pattern here in this figure and, and this figure. And uh, the results are, uh, are highly significant. And if you transfer this, uh, the numbers which you see here in the, in the, in the plot uh, to uh, dynamic ocean tide model, modeling, you get already uh, values in the order of a few millimeters and up to five millimeters for the North Atlantic. And this is already in, in the order of the accuracy of, uh, of the uh, 
tight models based on the data which, which we have today. So this is an issue which need to be taken into account into in the future for really high accuracy applications. Next uh, example is uh, on uh, uh, the um, hydrology in, in, in South America and uh, for here also uh, new studies have been uh, uh, performed uh, in the committee by applying uh, neural system modeling and arti artificial uh, intelligence. Um, the data which were used here are uh, hydrolog from the hydrological LSDM uh, model. And these data have been implemented in uh, this uh, uh, neural network here. Uh, and uh, there, uh, um, the uh, training uh, and validation methods have been apply applied for a time period of 15 years. And from this uh, hydrological model data, uh, grace-like observations were uh, extracted with a relatively low spatial distribution, which is typical for grace in the order of, of uh, 500 kilometers resolution. And uh, then, as I mentioned, for the training data from uh, 2003 until 2018 have been used. And with this data, a prediction has been uh, performed for the year 2019. And from the data, uh, this picture has been recovered. And here you see a very more detailed uh, structure here in the Amazon region coming uh, from the uh, learning process of, of the uh, hydrological model together with the grace-like -like observations. And that this method works is uh, shown here, demonstrated here. Here, the results are displayed for several months in, in the year 2019. And the observation, that means the original simulation is compared here with the prediction. Uh, and you see quite a good agreement here in the Amazon uh, region which is also expressed here in this uh, plot with correlations uh, of uh, higher than 0 0.9. I think this is a very good uh, demonstration that this uh, uh, process works. And I think it's also a very good example how uh, grace-like observations uh, can, uh, can be uh, further uh, uh, downscaled by, by using uh, hydrological models. And I think this is also a, a topic which is of high societal relevance because uh, the uh, mo monitoring of the water cycle and water management will become much more important in the future also due to climate change. So this is the final slide which uh, Mike uh, gave, gave to me and just uh, shows uh, some uh, planned actions. So, uh, a topic uh, in the future will be the three-dimensional structures of the Earth's crust and mantle and the analytic effects to co consider also non-tidal loading responses. And then another topic is to constrain the dynamically coupled model systems by geodetic observations and uh, also the work with the neural networks and data assimilation will be continued. So that's all what I have. Thank you. Questions or comments to this work? Okay, so there seems to be no question. Then we can con continue. So with uh, Richard. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, I prepared just a very few slides on this because I think everybody's familiar with the concept by now. Um, and I wanted to save a lot of time at the end for discussion since everybody's here in person in the room. I think we could have a good discussion on what the next step is in defining the central variables, central geodetic variables. 
So uh, the climate community was the first community to um, uh, establish essential climate uh, variables. The, uh, this was done by the Global Climate Observing System, and, and they did this to provide guidance for um, observing clim critical climate variables in the face of declining um, observation networks. So they needed a mechanism to talk to their decision makers to say, look, if this is what the climate community uh, considers to be essential. These are the variables that have to continue to be observed. And the concept they defined was that um, of a uh, that a, 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 an essential climate variable is some variable that's critical to characterizing years climate. It provides the empirical evidence, right, the observational evidence to understand and predict the evolution of climate guide mitigation, adaptation measures, assess risks, and enable attribution of climatic events to underlying causes. Um, and they underpin the climate services. So they identified the climate variables based upon relevance, right? Relevance to the climate system, feasibility of observing them, and the cost effectiveness of observing them, right? You, you can't spend uh, too much money um, uh, when you don't have much money. So uh, this concept uh, was very successful by um, the climate community. It was broadly adopted in science and policy circles um, as the basis for, priorita for prioritizing the requirements um, and uh, focusing uh, the actions needed uh, to um, study climate change. So they were the first community and based upon their success, uh, the ocean community um, followed them and following the ocean community, many, many others um, uh, have defined sets of central variables. So an example from, drawn from the um, ocean community uh, is might be an, an essential ocean variable called sea surface height. Um, so what the ocean community did was categorize the variables, not only the variable sea surface height, but um, sub variables associated with it, such as sea level anomaly or sea surface height gradients, also uh, variables um, uh, that are derived from that main uh, variable, such as tropical cyclone, heat potential, ocean volume variability, sea level rise trends. And, um, and, and also they define supporting variables, variables that are needed to support measurements of sea surface height. Geoid is included here. Uh, the mean sea surface, uh, geodetic data, uh, gravity measurements, okay? So geodesy, geodetic variables uh, come into play here. And they also provide contacts for further information about each of their variables. So if we wanted to apply this to uh, geodesy, the concept would be that an essential geodetic variable is some observed variable that's crucial to characterizing the geodetic properties of the earth and that are key to sustainable geodetic observations. So you can imagine that these might be things like the positions of reference um, uh, observing stations on the ground or radio sources in the sky, earth orientation uh, parameters, gravity measurements of different kinds. And then what you could do is to each uh, essential geodetic variable, you could assign requirements to them on, you know, the accuracy, stability that is needed to, to um, uh, for the observations of that variable, its, its resolution, its latency. And, um, and, and, and you could create, and similar to the ocean observing system, you could create a hierarchy of, of these geodetic variables. So not only have the fundamental variables, but you could have, you know, um, uh, products that depend upon those variables, like a terrestrial reference frame would depend upon 
uh, the uh, position of an observing station. And so if you, once you have requirements assigned to the variable, you can flow those requirements to the derived uh, products and you can flow those requirements to the infrastructure, the observing systems that's needed to um, observe those variables. Uh, so this is a way of updating the GEOS 2020 book. It's sort of a bottoms up approach to deriving uh, requirements on, on uh, geodetic products. And uh, so a, a committee was established within the Bureau of Products and Standards to uh, further this idea. And, um, and since the, uh, after the committee was established, we've heard that uh, the Bureau has uh, determined a list of geodetic products that's on the GEOS website. This is a fairly uh, comprehensive list of products categorized here in terms of uh, the geodetic themes, the reference frames, gravity, earth orientation, geometry, positioning, and applications. And this list of products then provides a nice starting position uh, for determining, deciding, discussing which of these products are, would be considered essential. Um, so if just as an example, you might consider earth orientation parameters to be essential. Uh, you might consider, you know, the um, observed position of, of, of a reference station to be essential. And, and derived from that would be the terrestrial reference frame. So I think this is pretty um, straightforward, pretty clear. Um, but given that list of geodetic products, what's, what's the next step? Um, I, think, I think before we delve into uh, examining that list and deciding which of those products are considered essential, we really need to identify the target audience for these um, essential geodetic variables. And broadly speaking, there's two different audiences, right? There's an internal audience, right? The geodetic community, and then there's the external audience, everybody else. Now, internally, right? If, if you're working on observing some variable, you're going to feel like you own that variable and you're going to want that variable to be considered essential. This means that basically every product on the list in on the GIGOS website is going to be considered essential to the geodetic community. And that's okay, right? Because we really want to apply, like I say, one of the um, one of the goals in defining this list is not only to just create that list, but to assign requirements to everything. So you'd really like to assign requirements to all the geodetic products. But the other audience, right, the external community, they don't want to hear that everything you do is considered essential. That's kind of you know, self-defeating. We would lose all credibility if we went to our decision makers and said, look at everything we do is essential. You've got to fund it all. Well, no, that's not going to work. So, um, so I think as a guide, you know, um, in creating a, an, an initial list of essential geodetic variables is that we should think of this list as supporting discussions with decision makers. Um, this could support discussions by the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence when they go to uh, countries, you know, to talk about the importance of geodesy. So they could say that, you know, the geodetic communities come together, they've provided a consensus of, on this list of, of, uh, of uh, variables that, that the geodetic community considers essential. So for that, for that application of the essential geodetic variables, what you need is a short list focused on variables that are key to sustaining geodetic observations, right? I mean, that's, I think, probably the foremost use of these variables outside of the geodetic community. And so I think if we use that as a guide, it would then be fairly straightforward to go through that list of products on the geodetic website and decide which ones that we want to uh, promote outside of the community to, to the decision makers. 
So that was my last slide. Like I say, this was a very short presentation because I really wanna hear from you uh, what uh, you feel about this approach going forward um, uh, on creating the list of essential geodetic variables um, with, with the idea that it is to support discussion with decision makers. So I turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for uh, pointing out the external uh, aspect of the essential geodetic variable. If you go, and I, that's what I did just to look to the essential climate variable, you have the full list of that. And most of the list, most of these variables are physical constants, measurable. You can measure with a sensor, with a, an instrument, and they speak to the general public. When you talk, uh, talk about, uh, for instance, temperature, pressure, direction of wind, et cetera, et cetera, these things are very easy to understand by the decision maker. Now we have to be very careful about defining essential geodetic variable. I don't think, for instance, that station coordinates will speak to the decision makers. They will not understand it. I am sure just because I did the experience myself I had discussion with IGN director who has nothing to do with geodesy, who doesn't know what geodesy is. And I just asked him, if I say to you that station positions are important, that terrestrial response frame is important, you have to explain to me all that. That's what he, that, uh, how he reacted to that. Mm -hmm. So we need to speak to the decision makers. We need to export our knowledge but in a way that is understandable, not only by decision makers, but also to the general public. Mm -hmm. And this is not an easy task. Yeah, that's right. And I agree with the trying to get a subset of least that, is, uh, that goes in that direction. I mean, understandable by the decision makers and the general public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. This is not going to be an easy task. Um, uh, but I, but it's an important task, and I think we need to do this. And I think it's something tangible that that we can do to support the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence when they talk to these decision makers. Because you are talking about the the uh, Global Geodetic Center of Excellence, but the uh, the the main mission of that center is sustainability of the geodetic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. If we want to use indicators or essential geodetic, vari uh, geodetic variables, these should be defined by IAG, the science community. Well, before. Yes, <laughs> yes. that's why we're here. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and we have to distinguish between the two, I mean, uh, 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 objects. Entities, I mean, uh, in terms of science, this should remain right. within the right. IAG. Internal and external. Yeah. I mean, there is a dichotomy there. There's going to be a tension there. Yeah. So, Richard, I would uh, like to address also one point in this in this context. So, the, you have shown the list of uh, some climate uh, essential climate variables, and you mentioned uh, that. Uh, for several of these variables, there are contributions, significant com contributions from the Odyssey. And also the same is for the uh, essential ocean variables. So how, how to deal with this? So I, I think we need a, a very good interaction between uh, IAG, FIGOS, and the other observing systems. And so how, how should we establish this? Um, yeah. Um, uh how to establish it well you talk to people right you you make contact with the with the other observing systems and let them know what we're doing and how it supports what they're doing they already know the importance of of geodetic measurements to sea level change for example right um but yes <laughs> uh 
So it's just a matter of, of, of dialogue. We need to just connect with the communities. Um, but we, um, um, but uh, that has to be done af after we, you know, have a, our own list of essential geodetic variables. And so we can then talk to them about how it relates to their lists. Uh, but if you take, uh, for example, uh, sea level or uh, terrestrial water storage, I think we have essential contributions there. We could probably think about it, uh, specifying this as a special, uh, as an essential geodetic variables, but they are already defined from the oh, other okay. services. But well, the parameters they or the background for the uh, essential geodetic variables from the mm -hmm. climate observing system or from the ocean observing system might be different. Yeah. Our viewpoint, how, how to deal with that to bring geology more in the, in the play? Well, certainly there's going to be overlap between the variables in the different communities. Sea level is both a, on, on an ocean, uh, an essential ocean variable, as well as an essential climate variable. And it could very well also be an essential geodetic variable. And that's okay because these different communities will, you know, feel ownership to it. Terrestrial water storage, you mentioned, that's, I think, the newest essential climate variable. And that is measured by um, one way of measuring it, by uh, satellite gravimetry. Um, and, um, and that's okay, you know. Um, these overlaps, I think, indicate the importance of the variables to the different uh, communities, and I think that's good. Uh, let's see, is there a question in the chat? Is that why you brought this up? Oh, a comment. Hi, Richard. Uh, I found that uh, this light is light is very illuminating to me because we have been talking about uh, essential geodetic variables, but uh, for decision makers, uh, probably the most important thing is the geodetic, global geodetic reference frame that is not a variable. And at the end, you wrote the geodetic products. Maybe we could uh, enlarge the topic and talk about the variables and products because people, decision makers, understand GGRF and understand what is reference frames and all, all geodetic uh, variables or products have a complex interactions. And maybe we could distinguish the two levels mm -hmm. of yeah. complexity. Yeah, certainly there's got to be a hierarchy um, of these uh, variables. Uh, reference frames not measured um, directly, right? And, but um, certainly it's the most important product from geodesy. And I think uh, I I think as as a target audience, we want to uh, keep in mind um, uh, the the need to sustain to improve to sustain the geodetic infrastructure, and so I think uh, we can use that as a guide when we define this list of essential geodetic variables. Hmm? If we add the variables and products, uh, maybe we can reach people easy, easy, easier. I don't know. <laughs> people. Richard, maybe one, one comment uh, on, on this again. Uh, so maybe we can, from the BPS, maybe we can support this initiative, which I think is really important to get to get progress regarding the definition of essential geodetic variables. And, and maybe as you also suggested, we can probably start from the products which, which are already now on the, on the Zeus website to think about these products and uh, to, uh, to think about uh, next steps, how, how to, to proceed. So I really would like uh, to interact with, with you on this issue mm -hmm. so that we can achieve progress. Certainly, yeah. Everybody's welcome to work on this. It's, uh, I think it's a, it's a big task, but it's an important one. And the more people involved, I think the better.
Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? Okay, so then I think we are done with the morning session. So thank you very much, Richard. And I think we should now take the opportunity for the for the group photo before going to, to lunch. Okay. Um Mike has still problem to um uh activate the microphone or to to solve the problem and um we in the uh, session of the Bureau of Networks and Observations. And there are also a lot of presentations uh, by um, the services and also by Daniela. <laughs> and uh, I think first we start uh, with your presentation and um, Mike will try to let his uh, microphone work. Okay, I have to share the screen. Oops. Okay. Hello, everybody. Then we start with um yeah almost the originally last presentation within the bureau of networks and observations it's about the chico standing committee uh, plato and so i will give this report um together with the co-chair benjamin Mendel on behalf of all the plato members for those of you attending the uaw just a few weeks ago uh, it's a small update included uh, but of course, not everything uh, changed. Um, just to remind you, uh, what is the task or what are the tasks of, of Plato, the performance simulations and architectural trade offs? So, the overall goal is to improve all components of the global geodetic reference frame, so terrestrial, celestial reference frames, and uh, EOPs to fulfill the Chigos requirement that are defined for accuracy and stability of the reference frame. And uh, to do this, um, there are several methods that are applied within the uh, members of the Plato group. And uh, basically, you can divide the, the methods into two groups. So on the one hand, simulation studies, and on the other hand, improved analysis strategies using already existing data sets. And if you go a bit more into details, there are, for instance, simulations for improved ground network geometry, new stations, new collocations, simulations for new observing concepts like intersatellite links, but only one example, we will see some others. And uh, then uh, the development of methods for optimal usage of satellite collocations. Uh, there exist already satellite collocations, but uh, these data are actually not uh, completely used for generating the reference frame product. So there could be method uh, developed uh, yeah, for analysis strategies, but also simulations for dedicated or other type of collocation satellites. And finally, the development of methods for, in general, the optimal usage of all existing geodetic uh, data that is already there. So um, I will start with a, uh, with a, a slide that um, uh, was presented last week at the ILRS uh, workshop by Anja Schlicht from Technical University of Munich. Uh, they are studying uh, ranging and time transfer and uh, just to to visualize um, what uh, is also the idea of uh, of Plato, uh, we have to deal with the um, situation that we have different um, observation types. So here, microwave observations, optical observations, then one way um, uh, measurements, two way measurements. And all these observation types have uh, different strengths and weaknesses. I don't want to go into details, but you can read it here. Um, so in general, the optimal usage of all these types of observations for uh, generating uh, the, or realizing the reference uh, frames uh, is one important uh, task uh, to do. And now uh, I will show a few uh, examples of uh, projects that are ongoing within the, the members of the Plato group. 
So starting with the topic of satellite collocations, there is at GFC one project called uh, Chigos Sim 2, where uh, yeah, a collocation satellite with all four space geodetic techniques were simulated uh, in order to make use of the so-called uh, space tie. Uh, they simulated basically six different orbit scenarios uh, for such a satellite. And um, yeah, similar to the local ties, I mean, the space tie by itself does not solve all the problems. Um, so um, if there uh, is an uncertainty or not accurately measured uh, values of this tie, you also will have problems with the reference frame. So uh, the GFC group also uh, simulated uh, the impact of, for instance, a one centimeter bias in one of these space tie components here for the, for the SLR component. And um, yeah, so um, uh, finally they found out that the uh, transfer of the datum via the space tie to other techniques can be realized on a, a millimeter level. And there were also presentations given at the REFAC meeting just a few weeks uh, ago. Uh, another uh, project running at uh, GFC uh, is dealing with uh, new observation types for satellite constellations. Uh, called next GNSS for, for TIGOS. So simulating the impact of new observation types like intersatellite links, accelerations, and then studying the, the impact on all the uh, geodetic uh, parameters of interest, including uh, datum uh, definition. And one uh, outcome of these studies is for, for instance, that Intersatellite ranges provide a powerful observation technique to improve the GNSS orbit uh, accuracy. And there are also some presentations given um, this year at COSPAR and the Commission 4 uh, meeting. Um, if we um, stick to uh, GNSS, the TU Vienna uh, group uh, is doing uh, simulations uh, on uh, uh, yeah, how a VLBI transmitter on uh, Galileo, one of the GNSS constellations, uh, could help. So um, they are basically estimating all parameters then uh, together. So the kinematic orbits of the Galileo satellites, the station coordinates, and here, of course, with VLBI, it plays an important role how you could best mix observations between satellites and uh, quasars. And uh, the big advantage of uh, such a type um, of uh, data and analysis would be that the VLBI observations uh, would then enable the direct estimation of uh, the satellite orbits in a celestial reference frame without uh, using uh, UT1 minus UTC for the transformation. And uh, yeah, the Vienna group also uh, planning some simulations to further uh, support the Genesis mission. We heard already uh, uh, this these days, yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. So um, just a, a new kind of simulation uh, we heard last week during the ILRS workshop uh, in Yebes um, is done by the Polish colleagues uh, from uh, Wroclaw University. Um, they look at to, uh, into satellite um, constellations with uh, passive satellites, so spherical satellites. Uh, those of you not that familiar with spherical satellites, uh, at the moment for the reference frame realization, we have the two Largios, Largios 1, Largios 2, the two Etalons at the Glonass orbits, and a few years ago launched Laris in a, a much uh, lower altitude, and just recently launched this year in July uh, Laris 2. And also it is called LARIS-2. It's not in the low orbital height uh, as LARIS-1, but it's in the same orbital height as the larger satellites. So in earlier plannings, it was all also named uh, LARIS-3 for this. Um, but it's the shape of, uh, of LARIS. And so what the Polish group uh, 
uh, started uh, to look at is first the impact of this newly launched satellite, LARES-2. Um, what does this really help for the reference frame uh, improvement? And then going further uh, and looking at other potential spherical satellites in different heights, so either larger height or LARES height, and in different orbital uh, characteristics, and from which of these they call it LARES 3 to, to 6, uh, one would uh, uh, expect the biggest uh, improvement for determining the geodetic uh, parameters. Yeah, um, another application of laser ranging here with a far away target, the moon, uh, LLR. Um, so the group in Hannover uh, is uh, developing, uh, an, let's say, a new analysis method, um, a part of the classical lunar laser ranging data, which is one station, one reflector on the moon. They derive the method of differential lunar laser ranging, uh, which is one station and two or more uh, reflectors uh, on the moon. And so the observation type is not the range as in the classical LLR, but the range difference. And the expectation here is that the accuracy greatly improves. And this is mainly uh, by the fact that the atmospheric error can be greatly or significantly uh, reduced. And uh, yeah, results from these uh, investigations were also presented last week at the ILRS uh, workshop in Yeves. Uh, coming back to VLBI, um, there one, one important step within the VLBI chain, let's say, is the, is the scheduling um, of observations. And um, so in some cases, you, um, yeah, you have, uh, let's say, the contradiction between geodetic and astrometric applications. Uh, and the scheduling um, might look different if you focus on geodetic or on astrometric. So the question is, what is the best method to bring both uh, uh, together within uh, the scheduling? And the group at uh, ETH Zurich uh, is looking into this aspect um, with uh, the general goal uh, that the scans uh, in the scheduling are e dis, um, equally distributed uh, with respect to, to time and resources. And so they, they apply their simulations to the VIGOS, so the new um, VLBI uh, systems and, and stations, and look finally for different scenarios on repeatabilities of EOPs, repeatability of station coordinates, and repeatabilities of uh, source coordinates. So all components of the of the global reference uh, frames. Yeah. Then we're coming to the um, to the optimal usage of uh, existing data and uh, several uh, studies that are ongoing here. So uh, one topic that uh, uh, was coming up in the past years uh, again, uh, which uh, I personally really uh, happy to see, is the application of, of troposphere ties uh, together uh, with local ties or in addition, um, or instead replacing local ties. And uh, one group uh, dealing with the aspect of tropospheric ties is uh, the group at ETH Zurich. So they combine GNSS and VLBI at the observation level within the, the Bernie software and their VLBI version and uh, looked at uh, test uh, data or, yeah, I mean, it's already available data, but tested uh, their a combination method based on the CON70 campaign and a global network of 180 GNSS sites. So as you're applying identical modeling, local ties, but the important thing also tropospheric ties. And as a result, the combined solution with applying tropospheric ties uh, significantly outperforms uh, single-based solutions uh, with only uh, local ties. Uh, for EOPs as well as for coordinates. 
this was also presented at the uh, REFAC meeting a few weeks ago. Uh, similar studies are going on at uh, GFC Potsdam. Um, they also combine VLBI and GNSS uh, by applying troposphere ties um, with the idea the GNSS network geometry is uh, stronger than the VLBI geometry and also uh, providing more observations. And they studied the tropospheric ties by using uh, cont campaigns, looking at the EOPs here on the right, and uh, using the intensive sessions, one hour short sessions, and then of course looking only at, uh, at UT1 here. And in all cases, you see that the application of tropospheric ties uh, improves uh, the EOP estimates. So finally, uh, VLBI only uh, aspect of uh, finding the best method for estimating new piece. Um, for those of you not that familiar with, with VLBI, uh, just to explain the idea here behind, um, the, the standard VLBI 24 hour sessions that is that are used for EOP estimations are the so-called R1 and R4 sessions. And you see here in the sketch, these 24 hours are um, uh, scheduled not midnight to midnight, but somewhere at a different epoch, usually 17, 17, 30, 18, something like this. And if you apply the standard EUP estimation 24 hours, this means that this 24 hour EUP from the VLBI R1 or R2 uh, re is representing something different from what you get from a 24 hour EUP of GNSS and SLR. So it's not comparable at the end, it's not really uh, combinable. And the idea is um, to find a better method how to, to make it comparable and combinable. And so a consortium of several VLBI analysis groups and combination center um, uh, carried out a, a pilot project and just saying, okay, we split somehow the VLB observations at midnight of these 24 hour sessions. And at the end, we applied a six hour EOP um, resolution with exactly splitting it at midnight and showing that this uh, makes sense for, for good EOP estimation uh, as well. And I think, yeah, that's it. That was our short selection out of uh, all the activities. And I would like to thank all the contributors to, to Plato and you for your attention. Okay. So I'm going to give a brief update on the IVS, the International VBI Service for Geodesy and Astrometry. So we are a non-profit um, investor. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yes, I can give it a try at least. <clears throat> yes, thank you. So we are a non-profit and best effort organization. As most of the services in the IIG, we have 80 plus permanent components, which includes network stations, meaning these are the, the uh, observatories with the radio telescopes and so on. We have correlator stations that take care of correlating the data. We have data centers that take care of keeping track on the data and the databases. We have, of course, analysis centers that analyze the data. We also continuously develop our technology further. So we need, we have technology development centers. We have centers that uh, take care of the operations, meaning uh, making the schedules and taking care on, of the, that the operation works smoothly and a coordinating center that has the overall coordination. These uh, 80 plus permanent components are distributed above uh, about uh, 40 plus institutions. And these institutions are a kind of a mix of uh, land survey agencies, uh, like for example, BKG in Germany or the Kartwerket in Norway or Landmetriet in Sweden and so on. Also space agencies are involved, universities and research institutions. And all these uh, institutions are in about 20 plus countries and we have roughly 350 associate members in the IBS. Um, so we have basically two observation programs today. 
One is uh, focusing on the so-called SX legacy VLBI, which is the, let's say, old, old version of the VLBI system. Uh, this goes back with observations to the late 70s. So our data, our time series started in the late 70s. And we have today on the order of 40 SX stations that are more or less regularly involved in these observations. These stations have radio telescopes that are quite uh, varying in size and, and also in speed. So many slow telescopes and many deforming telescopes because they were originally built for astronomical purposes, but then used for geodesy also. And with these telescopes, we do 24 hour sessions on the average three and a half per week of these 24 hour sessions. And there are two uh, sessions that are meant for EOP every week. These are one and our four that or were already mentioned earlier today by Daniela. And then there are a number of uh, dedicated sessions for TRF, for CRF, so for the terrestrial and the celestial reference frame, and also research and development sessions. So in overall, it is on, on the order of three and a half sessions per week that we have observed with the SX uh, in 24 hours. And then we have daily one hour sessions that are dedicated for UT1 minus UTC, and these are the so called intensive. So they use uh, not huge networks, but only two stations or three stations at the time. And there are several intensives, intensive one, two, and three. So this is a map that shows roughly the, the SX network that we have today in 2022. All the red ones, the red uh, triangles are IVS stations. And then we have the yellow circles that are cooperating SX stations that are mainly from the VLBA, from the American Very Long Baseline Array. So the distribution is not perfect, but it's rather good. So we have, of course, less stations in the Southern Hemisphere. That's something that most of the services uh, have as a problem. And uh, we don't have that many stations, of course, in the oceans, of course, and on islands and so on. So there's a little bit uh, few stations there. So then the other uh, series that we have is the VIGOS. So VIGOS is standing for the VLBI Global Observing System. So this is the next generation VLBI system for geodesy and astrometry. And it started to become operational in 2017 and it's really operational, let's say, since 2020. As of today, we have so far only 11 stations that are operationally contributing to VIGOS operational series and mainly uh, with the exception of one, all of them are in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is a little bit bad geometry in that sense. We have no long south-north baselines yet. And we do basically a similar approach with VIGOS also. We have 24-hour sessions, VIGOS sessions. We have operational ones that we call VO. They are operated weekly or right now bi-weekly because we have some kind of a backlog problem with data that needs to be correlated. And then we have a number of research and development sessions, so-called VR sessions, several per year, in order to develop the VIGO system further. And besides the 24-hour sessions, we also have the one-hour VIGO sessions for UT1 minus UTC, so similar to the SX intensives. So these are the VIGO intensives, the counterparts. And there are several sessions of this type during the week, so-called V2, S2, V2, and C2. The concept in itself, the VIGOS concept, is to use more uniform telescopes than we do with SX. And these telescopes are smaller in size, so only 12 to 13 meter. They are stiff so that they do not deform that much. And they are very fast so that they can move very fast and observe many sources on the sky in a, in a short time. And we use uh, broadband receivers that cover a wide frequency range between 2 and 14 gigahertz, where we can take different pieces of bandwidth and an observe, and it is also with two polarizations. The SX system is only with one polarization. And with this concept, we aim at having many, many observations per day. So on the order of two to 3,000 per day, which is roughly six times more than we can achieve with the SX system. And the data are preferably shipped electronically via optical fibers to the correlators. And the goal of the VIGOS concept is to improve the accuracy and precision with respect to the legacy SX VLBI system by one order of magnitude. There are also three twin telescope uh, projects. So there are twil, uh, dual or twin telescopes at different places. There's one operating one for VIGOS at Unsala, and then there are Vetzal and Yolosund that have one VIGOS and one SX right now. 
And the uh, idea here is to use uh, these uh, telescopes together and subnetting so that one can observe in different directions simultaneously and get a better handling of the atmospheric turbulence effects. Another option is there to connect VLBI and satellite methods, and we heard something about uh, VLBI to satellites earlier in this in this presentation by Daniela. So the network looks today like this here. We have, as you see, the majority of the stations in the northern hemisphere. And we have one station so far in the southern hemisphere that is operating on an operational routinely basis. A little bit about the uh, results that we achieved so far. On the left hand side, you see uh, analysis results from Essex legacy data from three years, 2019 to 2021. And on the right hand side, you see the corresponding time for Vigos data. Uh, these sessions were observed simultaneously, so in parallel, the SX network and the Vigos network. Uh, please be aware of that the scale is different here, so the Vigos uh, achieves much better station position repeatability than the SX. So we get down to roughly two millimeters or better for the horizontal and four, meter, four millimeters or better for the, for the vertical component. So today's Vigos is already two and a half times better than legacy SX. So this is very good news. If we look at the baseline repeatability from the same data set that we have analyzed here, the blue dots, uh, blue circles are the Vigos results and the red stars are the SX, corresponding SX results. And we see that the weighted RMS for the Vigos data is more than a factor of two better at 6,000 kilometers than for the SX. So this is really good news. Some other aspects I have no time to go into detail. We also looked at, two, at the UT1 minus UTC from Vigos intensives, and they are superior to the SX legacy. Polar motion is, on the other hand, slightly worse than SX, and this is mainly due to the so far sparse Vigos network. We do not have the long north south baseline that we have with the SX network. And another aspect is that we can use the Vigos data for multi frequency radio source imaging. So we, we have opened up a world of interesting research concerning the, the source structure and the imaging of radio sources at different frequency ranges and this will lead to improved and multi-frequency celestial reference frame. We also have uh, research and development sessions where we can see that we can uh, monitor uh, temporal resolution or we can we can resolve temporal resolution of the tropospheric parameters with five minutes uh, with for the standard totally lasing gradients and really address the, the atmospheric turbulence. And with the twin telescopes, we can also monitor the flux density with a very low latency. So that is good for scheduling of the Vigos sessions. So this is an outlook for the next upcoming, let's say, five to 10 years. So there will be kind of an explosion of Vigos telescopes operating in the Vigos system. So there are many that are on the way to become operational or to being established and becoming operational. So in a couple of years, we will have a Vigos network that is almost the same in extension and density as the SX network. So the outlook for the next 10 years is then that Vigos shall be the workhorse of the IVS to be used for all IVS products. So for the celestial reference frame, for the EUPs and the terrestrial reference frame, we aim at producing a multi-frequency celestial reference frame, meaning we want to continue with both the SX reference frame and build up and establish the Vigos Celestial Reference Frame on, on several frequencies. To do so, we need a globally distributed network of roughly 40 Vigos stations and 30 globally distributed legacy SX stations that still need to be operated sometime at least. And we have to have a sufficient number of correlators that can take the, the care of the data and, like, and correlate the data. So in the future, we anticipate that we will have twice daily Vigos U21 minus C determinations with very low latency and several sessions, 24 hour sessions with 12 and more stations per week for EOP and TRF and several 24 hour sessions per year for CRF, for, for multi-frequency CRF. And then of course, additional research and development sessions to develop further. The challenges of the IVS are that we are a best effort and non-profit organization, so we do not have common money. So all the, all the responsibility relies on the IVS member institutions. And it is quite expensive to establish new Vigo stations, and it takes time. 
So we have experienced that the rollout of Vigos is slower than expected. And uh, there are some stations that will come up, of course, in the next five, two to five years, but it takes more time than we had expected in the beginning. And several of the stations have not really reached full Vigos specification. So there will also be developments necessary there. Then there is a potential risk of increased uh, disturbances to RFI, radio frequency interferency in the Vigos bands. And that comes mainly from fifth generation mobile phone and satellite systems like Starlink and OneWeb and so on. And there are some initiatives on the way on the level of IAU and IUGG to protect the Vigos bands. We'll see how far we get with that. And one issue is also that we produce huge amount of raw data. Currently, it's about 25 terabyte per station during 24 hours. If we go over to full Vigos, it will increase at least by a factor of two to 50 terabytes. And these data need to be sent to the correlators, and there's still a bottleneck problem at the correlator end, because the correlator has to take all the data of the whole network. And we need also more IBS correlators. So these are our main challenges. And I think that is what I had to say. Okay. Um, all right, this is an update on the uh, ILRS. Uh, put together by uh, 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 Claudia, uh, Ericos, and and myself. Uh, and please speak also a little bit louder. Okay, uh, I may need you to forward this, forward these slides. Okay, all right. Uh, this is the uh, the current network, uh, and you can see there's a a lot of uh, a lot of activity going on here. Um, uh, so we have a new operational station in, in, uh, in Tenerife and an engineering station in Stuttgart, which I'll, I'll say something about that shortly. Um, the, uh, our Russian colleagues are testing the new Tashka SLR systems in co-location with their stations at uh, Mendelevo and Irkutsk. These are supposed to be uh, considerably higher performance systems in uh, the, uh, the patent for the future stations that uh, they are uh, deploying. Uh, we have new, new stations scheduled for operation in 2023, including uh, Yebis in Spain, La Plata in Argentina, uh, Metsahovi in Finland, Mount Abu and Panmunde in India, and uh, Tsukuba in Japan. And in 2025, a, a new station in Matera. NASA is deploying uh, its, uh, it, NASA and its affiliates are deploying uh, new stations in, uh, in the Allison, uh, Norway, in McDonald, in uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, in Mount, Mount Haleakala. And these will go out um, over, the next, over the next five years. Uh, there are new Russian stations planned uh, in Mexico, in the, Indonesia, uh, and uh, Spain, uh, but unfortunately, we do not have uh, any recent update on this uh, due to the current situation. Okay, uh, so you, you can see on the map here where the where the new stations are, are coming. Next, okay, this is uh, the new station in, in uh, Tenerife in in Spain, uh, which is operating. Uh, so it's it's a laser ranging station. Uh, over the next year, it's planned for uh, expansion into uh, space debris observations and uh, also uh, working in uh, optical communications. So it's going to be a very versatile system. Uh, at the moment, though, it is taking the uh, uh, SLR data. I also want to point out that this station is operating in both the green and the near infrared, uh, giving us uh, some expanded uh, capability in the, the infrared. Uh, the next, this is the new station in Yevis in Spain, uh, which is, should be uh, coming uh, into operation uh, early this next year. It's already uh, taking data. Uh, once again, this is a station that's now operating both green and the near infrared to give us uh, enhanced capability. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, uh, also, as I say, uh, take, taking data and, and doing quite well. Uh, the next station. Okay. This is uh, an engineering station in Stuttgart. Uh, interesting thing here is 
uh, these folks are building a small mobile uh, SLR station. Uh, the intention is to build something that is low cost so more players can get into the field. And uh, it's, uh, uh, as I say, it's, it's in, it, the station is operating. Uh, this, uh, this is in process and uh, we're hopeful that uh, this will uh, help reduce the cost uh, to uh, many of the, uh, many new, so new operators can join. Next. Uh, this is a, a campaign. Uh, we have a number of campaigns that we carry out. I just wanted to point out, this is one with a new uh, Indian uh, space research organization. Uh, they're putting in two SLR stations in India, uh, north and south. And uh, the intent is to track uh, some of the synchronous satellites in their, in their um, IRNSS satellite uh, constellation. Uh, the, their satellite, their um, stations are not ready yet, uh, but we did try a preliminary campaign uh, last fall, and, uh, and some, of the, some, of our, some of our stations did, did fairly well. Uh, many did not do so well, uh, but the intent is to try and get um, SLR data spread evenly over the, uh, the uh, figure eight, uh, the, the oval, whatever the uh, particular pattern has to be, is to accommodate the, uh, the particular orbit. Uh, so uh, hopefully they'd like to see something like uh, what we have on the right here, um, and, uh, we'll, and we'll see. The uh, campaign itself would probably be conducted, as I say, in 2023 or maybe four, depending upon when their SLR stations are operational. Okay, next. Okay. This is the uh, new uh, LARES-2 satellite. This is another uh, cannonball or uh, whatever, you, whatever term you want to use, uh, a uh, solid uh, sphere covered with retro reflectors. Um, this uh, has the new advantage of uh, a, a much closer packing of small retro reflectors. And this has the advantage that the signal coming back uh, is fairly uniform, uh, independent of the aspect uh, on the satellite itself. As I might point out, as you may know, uh, we do have variations that we see in Lagios 1, Lagios 2, Lares 1, and uh, looks like these are, are missing. Uh, so that, that does not have that problem. The uh, initial data taken over the first uh, two or three months uh, gives us um, a, uh, a, a weekly, weekly um, solutions were done. <clears throat> and they're giving us uh, levels of uh, uh, between a few to about uh, one to about uh, 10 uh, millimeters. Uh, at the moment though, uh, the uh, correction, uh, the center of mass correction that's being used here is only an approximation and, uh, and may be you know, part of the reason why, we, why we're getting a, a variation. The anticipation is that it should be a few millimeters. So we'll see as time goes on and data continues to come in. The next. These are, uh, as you, you may know, we have the issue that uh, ranging data must be corrected to the center of mass of the satellite. Okay. And uh, we have uh, uh, engineering uh, analyses that go on to calculate these center of masses. This is, uh, these are two satellites that the Russians plan to launch, similar to what uh, has been launched in the past, that have zero or very small uh, uh, satellite uh, target signatures. Uh, and uh, the top one are, uh, are some concentric uh, spheres uh, that um, are engineered in such a way that the uh, center of mass correction is zero. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, once again, I, I, we do not have uh, any mo most recent update on this uh, due to the current, uh, current situation, but our experience in the past was very good. Next, um, just some comments on the analysis activity. Uh, as you know, the final version of the ITRF 20, 
2020 was released uh, last uh, April. Um, and the, uh, the SLR has incorporated a new approach in handling systematic errors uh, that relies on the systematic error model that has been developed by uh, uh, Eric Oson and the, and the other folks in the, uh, in the, in the analysis standing committee. Um, uh, and uh, this has made uh, quite a difference as seen uh, by the uh, significant reduction and the difference between scale between the SLR and the and the VLBI, and uh, anyhow, so they continue uh, generating uh, weekly solutions and uh, and looking at the dependency on the station position orbits and station systematics, etc. So uh, we expect uh, additional improvement in this area. Um, the Okay. Now, in terms of the uh, work, uh, the upcoming work, uh, the new solutions for uh, 2023, uh, they, these will include La uh, LARAS 2, which of course was not in the previous one, in the operational data product. Uh, it'll also include estimation of low degree uh, order gravity field terms, include that, and uh, also, they will be adding uh, loading corrections at the observation level uh, to a special uh, internal uh, operational product, also in 2023. So we expect uh, some, some continued improvement, a significant improvement over the, over the next several years. Next. Okay, I just wanted to point out some of the issues and challenges that we have. Uh, first of all, even with all of those stations, uh, there's still geographic gaps, uh, primarily in Latin America, Africa, and Oceania, uh, similar to what the VLBI has, has pointed out. Uh, more and more stations are joining the network, but unfortunately, uh, many are not doing anything to, uh, to improve the, the geographic distribution. Uh, we do suffer from a mix of new and old technologies. Uh, also, you know, levels of uh, financial support, weather, et cetera. Uh, so we have uh, many stations do very well and quite a number of stations do not do so well. Uh, so I would say about half the SLR stations are providing uh, significant data uh, for, the, uh, for the ITRF. Uh, the, the other half, while uh, supporting uh, other missions, uh, altimeter missions, gravity field, et cetera, are, uh, are not making much of a contribution to the, uh, to the reference frame. And uh, we point that out as, as a, a big issue. Uh, the uh, data quality uh, continues to improve, as I mentioned, um, it, on the uh, systematic modeling that we've been doing. Uh, that, that has really probably been the biggest step in the last year or two. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the number of target satellites uh, continues to increase as new missions use SLR for orbital determination and other applications. Uh, more than half the satellites now, probably even two thirds of the satellites now, are a GNSS. Um, and uh, we're trying to accommodate them uh, at the moment, we are tracking about 120 satellites, and uh, soon this is to increase to about 140 with the uh, Beidou uh, uh, constellation uh, in increasing the uh, number of satellites that it has requested. We discussed this at length with the IGS uh, and whether we should be trying to track so many satellites uh, as opposed to trying to focus on a few, but apparently this is the strategy that they uh, would like to, uh, us to continue working on. Uh, now, uh, the way we have handled this is uh, we allow certain number of satellites to go on what we call our priority list. And these are the satellites that the stations are requested to track. Uh, you know, many of the, I, uh, the, uh, the, uh, GNSS satellites uh, 
are tracked at an as time available basis. So uh, if stations have time and there is, is an opportunity, uh, they are welcome to track one of these, what I call non-priority satellites. And uh, that, that's, that has the, the way that we have been operating. So that's, that's a quick uh, picture of what's, uh, what's happening. Um, if uh, some of you attended the uh, laser workshop uh, last week, uh, you will have seen uh, many of the new developments that the, the SLS stations have been implementing and uh, also lots of what has happened in the, uh, the analysis world in, in SLR. So if you haven't had that, if you didn't have that opportunity, uh, all of those uh, presentations will be put on the website and you can go and take a look at them. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Any questions? Are there any questions for Mike? Okay, then we go on to the next presentation. Um, good afternoon to Munich. Um, I'm Markus Brotke and I'm the IGS infrastructure coordinator. And I'd like to give you a short overview about the current status and the future plans um, of the IGS infrastructure. So uh, we, we have everlasting change. So we have new signals. We get more and more stations into our network. Um, there are new applications that we need to serve. And on the other hand, um, there are modern IT architectures that we need to consider and also modern data formats. So all of these evolutions and changes we need to incorporate into our yeah, IGS infrastructure and into the plans for the future. So let's start with the IGS network. So the current status is that we have around about 500 um, stations in our network. Uh, roughly 60% um, are considered multi-GNSS, meaning that they track the four global navigation satellite systems. Um, those are highlighted in blue here on the map and 300 of our stations track or yeah, they track, they, they send data in real time. We receive contributions from 120 organizations um, that are generally operated and supported by public funded organizations like the other IAG um, services. Um, 20 organizations um, cover 70% of the entire network though. We receive or yeah, we receive contributions from 116 countries or regions. Um, 13 countries provide more than 10 stations, which make up to 50% of our entire network. And there are 82 countries um, that contribute with less, less than four stations. And as you could see also on, on the map, uh, yeah, we are lacking contributions from uh, mostly from Africa or from Siberia and also from China. So what would be a path forward here? Um, we already have a lot of built-in resilience um, in our network. So we have different station operators. Uh, we use different hardware manufacturers. So we don't rely on one or two of the, of the main vendors out there. And we also have resilience in terms of yeah, duplications in, in location. And we still need to go forward and enhance our tracking network. Um, we need to improve on a, on a faulty multi-GNSS network. Um, since only 30% of the network track all available signals. So you, you saw that for um, that 60% of the network track multi-GNSS, but they don't track all the signals in most cases. Um, and we aim for a high quality uh, redundant network with multi-GNSS and real-time capabilities. 
We also would like to support operators in underrepresented regions of the world so that we can uh, slowly but steadily uh, fill our gaps. And therefore, we want to go and expand the capacity development resources. So we want to build knowledge bases and yeah, we would like to support every station operator out there. Um, the second part uh, of our infrastructure is the IT infrastructure. So we currently have six global data centers, as you can see here in red, and seven regional data centers. Um, we have a high dependency on CDDAS as the biggest data archive, though. The data synchronization between the global data centers has never been a requirement, nor is it currently feasible. Each center is essentially independent in how it handles IT security, quality checks, uh, which protocol uh, they're going to use, and so on. And there are also global data centers out there that can't even accept data input from a station operator. There are also QC standards from, from high to non-existence and data provenance uh, is also lacking here. Um, yeah, I, IT security is still underestimated, but it affects everyone. Uh, it starts at the receiver infrastructure, goes to the data centers, up to the analyzer centers. And yeah, we have the feeling that the security is not taken seriously until yeah, the first incident happens and you feel the pain. But this is yeah, the, the current state within the IGS infrastructure. So yeah, we would highlight here the, the free tenants of information security, yeah, and go go away forward uh, and yeah make our infrastructure more secure. So a path forward here. Um, on one hand, information security. So there should be data provider agreements um, with IT security requirements. Um, it would also be useful to have cryptographic checksums that originated from the receivers. Uh, we want to make it a requirement to use encryption protocols only. So there are still data centers that use FTP, um, which is highly insecure. And data archive centers must undergo some independent IC, IT security audits yearly. But since we have a lot of global data centers with, yeah, which operate on different levels, our idea is to yeah, investigate or implement some kind of yeah, global data archive centers, um, which have defined um, data archive QC standards that also have to sign some kind of service level agreements uh, to the IGS that collect metadata and that also synchronize uh, data uh, among them. Um, another topic that we are working on is uh, related to data storage methods. So more and more agencies out there are forced or they voluntarily move their data centers to cloud and object storage. And as they do that, uh, they realize that maintaining Rhinex, so our data exchange format, uh, as an archive format is complex and expensive. So we have the problem here of fixed file lengths. So we either have daily, hourly, or sub-hourly files. Um, we can't provide multiple sampling rates of the, of the same content without duplicating it. We can't filter data by observations or satellite systems um, from remote. Uh, it's basically impossible. And yeah, syncing with other archives is cumbersome. So yeah, we are we are 
currently exploring modern standards for storing observation data in cloud native storage engines. That's one of our yeah our topics right now. And when you talk about data storage, you also need to talk about data access. Um, so accessing the data from different data centers is yes effortful. So we have different archive structures, different protocols, as we mentioned. So FTP, HTTPS, SFTP. We also have different data holdings. Um, so that's that's a problem. And as I mentioned before, we have an, an all or nothing approach to access and to collect data. So if you're only interested in uh, signal to noise ratios for GPS, you would still need to collect uh, basically everything that's in a file, even if you don't need it. Um, so we are aiming for uh, customized file generations using APIs. So we have different users with different needs that we like to accommodate. And we want to develop case studies and user stories with the community to yeah, make, make the most out of it. Yeah. Um, last point here uh, is concerning metadata. So the, the current metadata standards, they don't serve the needs of new and especially non-geodetic users. Um, our data and metadata, they need to be standardized and fair. And the increase in volume and complexity of data means also that we need to create, transfer, and use uh, data and metadata with a machine readable format. So this is where Geodes ML plays a role here and has been developed by, yeah, basically by Geoscience Australia with inputs from New Zealand government agencies and also from the former IGS data center working group. And this is the new applications, it, or it's a new application schema of GML. And yeah, which is the geography markup language. And yeah, that's a standard which makes data and metadata discoverable and interoperable. And you can easily transfer data via web services. And it's based on internationally recognized standards. All right. So as a quick recap on summary, uh, we need to modernize our IGS infrastructure, and it's a priority. Um, we would like to enhance the IGS tracking network to address the shifting user needs. We need to advocate the importance of information security to improve the resilience of the infrastructure. We want to explore modern standards, data storage, and access methodologies to improve the fairness of the IGS data and metadata. And we are investigating a higher tier of data center. Okay, that's all from my side. And thank you for your attention. So we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jérôme Saunier. I am the IDS Network representative. Uh, this is a, a short uh, status report on the, the RIS network. Uh, first, uh, some uh, reminders about the, the RIS network features. Uh, the network was uh, built to serve uh, space altimetry from 1992. This graph shows the, the past uh, satellites and uh, the eight uh, current Doris equipped satellites in, in blue color. And uh, we have um, a number of new missions already agreed that uh, secures the, the future till uh, 2035 at least. Regarding the ground network, um, thanks to, to its uh, centralized uh, management by CNES and IGN, we have a very homogeneous uh, station distribution and a good network uh, reliability. We now focus on um, the, the network strength. Uh, the current network has 
58 stations, uh, very well distributed uh, geographically. However, we have uh, still um, some covered gaps, in, in particular uh, over um, the Pacific Ocean, but uh, we have new uh, Doris sites uh, that will soon uh, fill these uh, covered gaps. And uh, we will see that in the, the next slides. Uh, another network uh, strength is the long lifespan of the stations. Half of the current network stations are as more than 21 years data availability, as shown uh, by this graph. We can say that we have a high operational uh, reliability of the stations with a very few uh, interruptions of uh, service in, in total as you can see uh, in, in red on this graph. Um, this is the results of the close monitoring of the maintenance teams at CNES, at IGN, and of course, with the help of uh, our local uh, partners. The third uh, distinctive feature of the Doris network is the collocation with other geodetic techniques and with uh, tie gauges. Most of the stations are collocated with GNSS stations that are part of the IGS network. And uh, it is worth uh, noting that we have four core sites with the four techniques. And um, <clears throat> also, um, on, on the occasion of installation or maintenance on site, um, we perform a systematic site survey, um, which is a significant contribution to the ITRF construction. The current status of the network operation is quite good. After um, two difficult years due, due to the sanitary crisis, that has um, considerably uh, complicated field operations and maintenance. Um, hopefully, uh, since the beginning of this year, all is back to order with around 88% uh, uh, of active sites uh, delivering data. And we have just uh, five stations currently out of order. For the coming years, uh, we have various developments uh, underway. Uh, we will continue uh, the gradual uh, replacement of the equipment, uh, first with uh, the Starek C antenna. Uh, we start the deployment uh, from uh, 2014, and we have now uh, 23 stations already equipped. And second, with the fourth generation beacon, uh, started in, from uh, 2019, and we have 26 stations already equipped. Uh, we would like to make the network denser with 10 additional uh, stations to reach a total of uh, 70 uh, stations. Um, we made uh, these decisions uh, at the uh, IDS uh, retreat in 2019. Uh, we will continue to perform uh, site renovation to, to better meet the system requirements, uh, in particular to improve the Tena environment, which is very important uh, uh, for the station performance. And we have uh, four uh, relocation planned uh, in the next years uh, at uh, in Nepal, at Everest, in Rikitea, uh, Cachoeira Polista in Brazil, and Sal in Cape Verde. And uh, finally, uh, another uh, development is to connect uh, the risk beacons with GNSS receivers. Um, the, the technical solution is under progress at NES, and we hope to start uh, this work um, next year. Uh, regarding the densification, uh, <clears throat> 
in the next year um, we will have uh, three um, additional sites um, first and the most uh, expected is Angarua in uh, um, Easter Island uh, then uh, also expected uh, at North Australia in Catherine that is a, a collocation with uh, GNSS and VLBI uh, with the help of uh, Geoscience uh, Australia. And uh, finally, uh, in Gavdos, uh, <clears throat> um, in, at the ESA uh, site, um, uh, calibration site. Um, in 2024, uh, two other uh, projects, uh, first uh, in Mongolia uh, to to replace um, the <clears throat> Krasnoyarsk uh, station we, we had in Russia. Um, and uh, then um, another uh, expected project is in China, in Changshun, with a collocation with GNSS and SLR. Um, we will uh, decide uh, at uh, IDS Governing Board meet uh by the end of this year um uh, between uh, la plata uh, and kampur uh, in india uh, to have an additional site maybe uh, in 2024 and uh, finally uh, the french uh, contribution to uh, uh, uh gigos uh, with uh, uh, a project uh, with uh, four technic sites in uh, Tahiti Island. Finally, some uh, IDS news. We have uh, currently election to renew two position at IDS Governing Board. Uh, we are preparing the uh, the special issue in advances in space research. Um, we. <clears throat> We had uh, the IDS uh, workshop in Venice uh, two weeks ago. All, all the presentations are now available uh, on the, the IDS website, and uh, we are preparing um, a new IDS newsletter. That's it. It was uh, very short, and here you have, uh, if you want further information on the Doris network, we have this uh, recent uh, publication. That will be part to uh, so there is a special issue, but already uh, available online and some documentation on the website. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions? Yes. Ah. Yeah, this is Har Harald Schuh speaking. I have a question concerning your slide number four, where you showed the time of operation and in red, out of order. For me, it seems relatively long for some stations. What is the reason? Because it's a simple, a simple technology. I mean, why, why do we have so relatively long red bars? uh well um we have uh, very uh, remote uh, sites uh, like uh, in in Socorro island um um what else um we have problem also uh in battery in russia uh with a long uh, time to 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 get the customs clearance <clears throat> that is very uh, a big problem with russia uh, concerning Santa Cruz, uh, we we lost uh, equipment, uh, uh, replacing equipment. So it 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 took a very long time to to reactivate the, the stations. Um, but <clears throat> you know, mainly um, our problems is is. Um, with customs and the time to to send equipment and install it okay i understand so it's it includes everything all all local problems with transportation and customs and so on yeah 
Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, we can move to the next presentation, the Georges. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, apologies for not uh, being there, but unfortunately, this is a semester that we have a lot of teaching obligations of me and Ricardo, so we have to be to go. I have to give this uh, uh, talk remotely. So I will uh, try to, to briefly summarize uh, the activities uh, carried out in the last period by IGFS. Uh, so you know the structure of IGFS. It uh, actually uh, coordinates uh, five services related to the aircraft field. Uh, so uh, PGI, ASG, I get ICGM and IDEMS. Uh, I will uh, go uh, briefly uh, through the latest activities that we have uh, carried out. The main activity by IHGFS uh, has been towards the IHRS. So uh, the uh, efforts, uh, a significant amount of effort has been uh, put for the realization of the IHRS into the IHRF. Uh, so that, uh, as you will see later on in the next slides, uh, so that uh, probably within the next year, we will actually be able to, rea uh, to realize the uh, service. In that frame, uh, we have been investigating various options, various uh, approaches in order to determine potential uh, values at various stations around the Earth. Uh, so using uh, local geoid models, local gravity fields, uh, local gravity data, global geopotential models, and uh, global Earth topography models. Uh, uh, the cost C carries on the usual operations, so preparing uh, temporal gravity fields, uh, and uh, now uh, the latest so solutions, all, all the solutions are uploaded in the, in the ICGM. Uh, the BTI continues the uh, collection of uh, local gravity data around the uh, globe, uh, so that they are freely available uh, if this, this is possible. Uh, and also participates with the establishment of the International Absolute Gravity Reference System frame. Uh, the uh, IGETS, uh, it continues uh, the operation uh, of the database for the border motion length of uh, day. Uh, and the ICGM uh, has established uh, a new, uh, or let's say better, an updated version uh, of their browser, uh, which uh, allows the more, um, uh, the easier uh, and the intuitive uh, computation of both static and temporal uh, models. Uh, and uh, also, they are continuing their operations now. The, uh, the latest uh, temporal gravity fields are online. The latest one is from August 2022. Uh, for the digital uh, Earth model uh, service, uh, the items, uh, they participate in a joint study group uh, which uh, works uh, on how to bridge uh, the gap uh, between the bathymetry topography models and how to combine uh, these uh, uh, models, the bathymetry topography models, in the land sea boundary. The International Service for the Geoid, uh, they continue uh, uh, the population of the uh, geoid models around uh, the Earth, uh, local and regional uh, models. Uh, it was uh, quite important that the attribute that they are uh, giving now DOIs to the models uh, so we, uh, that uh, uh, people who are interested to use them can actually give uh, a reference to uh, them. Uh, so, as I said, uh, the main effort now uh, within the services and within the uh, IGFS is uh, given the fact that we have now the defining standards uh, for the IHRS to actually uh, perform the realization of the IHRS. Uh, these uh, slides have been uh, shown by Laura uh, during the GGHS 2022 and the REFAC 2022 meetings. Um, so uh, we are at this uh, stage now where we have uh, a number of stations around uh, the uh, globe and um, we have the horizontal coordinates and we have to uh, determine potential values. So there is, uh, on a voluntary basis, of course, uh, there is a significant amount of effort by various colleagues. Uh, uh, around the uh, uh, globe in order to uh, determine potential values so that we uh, can achieve the realization of the IHRF. Uh, this is uh, the latest, uh, let's say, uh, distribution of the stations, are 170 stations. Uh, in many cases, uh, there are collocate observations as well, as you, as you see here in the slide with VLBI, SLR, DORIS, also gravity, tight cages, and uh, leveling. Uh, uh the uh, uh coverage is more or less uh, i can say uh, good around uh, the globe with uh, 
is this uh, usual in this case a concentration uh, uh, around Europe and North America. Um, a significant amount of effort has been uh, put to the Colorado experiment. Uh, this is an experiment during which uh, all of these groups uh, worldwide have been provided with the same data, so the same the same input data, referring to local gravity data, airborne gravity data, uh, and digital topography models, with the aim to determine independently from each other. Uh, a geoid model for the area over the, the Colorado that, that you see here, uh, following their own method and approach for the model to be geoid. Within that frame, uh, all these groups also determine potential values for the leveling stations uh, over this area. What we have achieved uh, is compared to the mean geoid taken from all uh, groups, uh, let's say an agreement at the two centimeter level. We are not uh, at the level of accuracy of the geometric services, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, the good thing is that when we are determining potential values, and I have to stress again here that uh, the, uh, each group has followed uh, independent approaches, so without any bias to uh, follow the same approach, uh, we uh, reach a more or less um, uh, good agreement in terms of the uh, potential uh, values. So this red line here that, that you see, this is the GSVS line. Uh, this is a high accuracy uh, uh, leveling line where we have collocated Genesis observations as well. So this is the line where we did all of the evaluation of the uh, geoid models. Uh, in terms of uh, the comparisons uh, between the potential values determined from the uh, uh, gravity data uh, and from uh, those determined from the leveling uh, data, uh, uh, the agreement is at the uh, 0.2 meters per second, sec second square uh, level, but we have some extreme cases, some points uh, where the uh, agreement reaches the 14.1 centimeter uh, level. So there is still a uh, place uh, and amount to uh, work. Uh, this again, but from uh, Laura's uh, presentation, uh, a slide uh, from the REFI 2022, this uh, gives you an idea uh, the blue uh, ones indicate where we have uh, completed the work, so we have, where we have potential values estimated for North America, for North uh, Europe, for Japan and Australia, and uh, the work in progress. So there's still uh, uh, work to be done in South America and in Oceania and uh, Asia. Uh, so in areas where we do not have local gravity data available, then the approach is to use global geopotential models uh, in order to determine the potential values uh, there. Uh, this is actually my uh, last slide. Uh, this uh, shows the outlook for the IHRS IHRF within, I hope, the next year. Uh, the blue one shows uh, what has been already established, and uh, sorry, the uh, gray ones what has been already established, and the blue ones what we are aiming at uh, during uh, the next couple of years. Uh, so. Uh, with uh, the setup uh, of the theoretical parameters for the IHRS and the realization of the stations, it's now important to uh, reach a point where the IHRF will be an actual service. Uh, this is our goal. Uh, this will be a service uh, within the, uh, I, uh, the I, IHRS, uh, the IHRF will be a service within the IGFS. And the aim is uh, to provide uh, potential uh, values and provide uh, the so-called so IHRF products, so potential values, uh, determination uh, and uh, parameters for the uh, unification of local vertical datums into the global uh, ones, and uh, through the services BGI and ISG uh, mean gravity anomalies, so that uh, people who are interested can carry out their own potential determination and uh, geoid and positive model in this respect. So, uh, in uh, close co cooperation uh, with uh, Kikos, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, within the next uh, one uh, or two uh, years, uh, we will be uh, able to realize the IHR uh, service and produce uh, products uh, in uh, the sense that other sites will give, give them. Okay, uh, this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Are there any questions?
Uh, yeah, it's Mike Perlman. Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, George, um, I'm, I'm wondering, we have um, argued along that uh, these uh, gravity field stations uh, should actually be part of the, the core network. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, whether we've done it effectively. Uh, uh, and, and the reason I ask that is I had a, a discussion with somebody uh, who has several SLR stations and VLBI stations involved and did not uh, realize the importance of the gravity field. So uh, I'm wondering whether uh, we need to do a, a better job of uh, advertising that uh, importance as being, you know, a, a, an integral part of the network stations, and the network stations should should include that as as one of the fundamental measuring techniques. Hello, uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, can you, can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the uh, let's say comment, Mike, is uh, whether it would be advisable, let's say, to have the IHRF stations uh, as part of the core network, right? Uh, if, from uh, in uh, my view, uh, I think that if you are able to have as many collocated methods as possible, the, the better. In order to have an IHRF station, you should have an absolute gravity meter there as well. Uh, uh, Laura is uh, in the panel, so she can uh, jump in, but at least for all the stations that we uh, have uh, here, uh, it uh, goes that uh, there is some absolute value for the gravity meter in this uh, station. I can see this on, as, on, as the only uh, limitation, and also that we uh, connect these uh, stations, it would be good let's say to connect these stations with tight gauge stations as well because the tight gauge stations in most cases they realize the local vertical data so if you have uh, i can uh, talk for a couple of stations uh, for example the station that we have here in Thessaloniki. Uh, this is an ihrf station we have absolute gravity there uh, we have gnss and we it is in close proximity with the leveling network the local le le leveling network and the tight cages so we, so we were able to connect it with the national vertical data in that sense this station can also be part of the global network of the ahrf but also provide the ties this last this last uh, slide i have shown uh for the uh offset of the local vertical data to, to the global to the global one uh so to sum up if we could have that it would be ideal yes i don't know laura if you want to uh, yeah I, I wanted to add um we have the unified analysis workshop two weeks ago in in the saloniki and we have a session called uh, reference frames in physical geodesy and the recommendations in this session was uh, to extend this uh, catalog uh, for the um, fundamental GIGOS observatories by including a key aspect for gravity reference stations and high reference stations. So uh, we have to talk about Mike to, to update this document, including also the, the physical uh, reference stations. I, I think this is the, the most expedient way to, yeah. to make evident the importance and the necessity of having these these stations also in the in the geodetic infrastructure. Would we expect to make this a requirement for all core uh, core stations? In other words, those stations that already have or will have uh, SLR and, and and VLBI or um, uh, or maybe just you know, one or the other. Uh, would we ex expect that to have all all the stations outfitted with the gravity field measurements? Uh, if there is a core station, yes, because yeah. if you have SLR Doris or or uh, VLBI stations, it's ideal that these stations are also collocated with GNSS. 
And for the high reference uh, system, for instance, we need continuously operating GNS stations and gravity field modeling. And this is, uh, if we include in the, in the GIGO score stations descriptions that we need a precise geoid at these stations, we have solved the problem for the high reference frame. And regarding the absolute uh, gravity measurements, uh, I, I think it could be also also handled to to have absolute gravity measurements yeah. at these new stations. Yeah, now, I, I think we have to make it clear what it is exactly that we we want. Um, uh, the particular person that I was I was talking to, and I'll, I'll mention him here. It was uh, was uh, Stephen Merkowitz, uh, who pointed out that in the NASA documentation uh, to institute their space geodesy. Uh, a program which is at, you know, actually part of part of the uh, GIGOS and, and part of the services, um, there was no specification in there for particular for for, for gravity field measurements, and uh, you know we we've said it uh, a number of times, but I think we've got to be more more specific. I mean, what what is it exactly that that that, that we want, uh, and probably have to make a better case. Uh, for it, uh, and uh, the reason I bring it up is, um, uh, they had the opportunity to acquire some gravity field measurement equipment, and uh, they they turned it down. And I, and I said, "You did what?" I said, yeah, well, you know, it's it's not in our, our NASA plan. So uh, anyhow, uh, and, it, and it may be the same in, in in other stations who have specified what it is that they want and, and maybe haven't included the gravity field. So I think I think we've got to make make more of an effort there and make it clear as to, as to you know why we need it and uh, uh, that uh, that that uh, really uh, it's a whole it's a whole suite of equipment that we need and, and it's not just you know the SLR it's not just that what I call the uh, the, uh, the, the 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 geodetic uh, component. We've got to, We've got to make the uh, gravity field component uh, stronger. Uh, yes, uh, at the Unified Analysis Workshop, uh, a colleague from BKG, uh, Harmut Vitsiontek, made a very nice presentation about the requirements for absolute gravity reference stations. Uh, this will be included in our report. Uh, for this session, uh, it has to be ready next week. Uh, and our recommendation will be to extend this description for for the catalog of the GIGO score sites to, to make this clear. Uh, okay. But uh, I think uh, with the presentation, uh, Harmus' presentation was very nice to see the importance of having absolute gravity reference stations and now with, with this core network for the high reference frame. Yeah. All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Then I would like to say that we should move on to the next presentation by Elizabeth. Please share Good screen. afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'll try sharing the screen then. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Bradshaw. I'm head of the PSMSL. Um, I'm very grateful to be invited to give this presentation because unfortunately I couldn't make the UAW workshop, so it's nice to be able to talk to everybody here. I'd also like to thank Andy Matthews. He's the technical lead of PSMSL, and we've just recently recruited a new data manager, Chan Mee Kim, and it's really good to have a, a new input to the service. So, um, PSMSL was founded in 1933, and next year is going to be our 90th anniversary. It was originally set up for the study of tides and tidal currents and movement of the sea surface. So its origins were slightly different. It was about ocean dynamics and land movement and not really monitoring sea level rise. Um, but we're now a service of both uh, IAG and the International Association for Physical Sciences of the Oceans. Um, we're hosted by the UK's National Oceanography Centre. And our data set contains more than 2,000 stations, 70,000 site years worth of data from over 188 suppliers. And most recently, our annual mean sea level data set was an integral component of the most recent IPCC report on projections of sea level change. But the data are used for lots of purposes, 
to validate models, looking at tsunamis and storm surges, and also validating satellite altimeters. So what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, our, our kind of primary function is to collect monthly mean sea level and redistribute it in a common format. But we also produce and distribute sea level products such as trends and estimates of land, well, we uh, display estimates of land movement. We work with lots of other people on improving provision of tire gauge data of all types, such as the Global Sea Level Observing System, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and various other uh, intergovernmental organizations, uh, projects and programs and uh, organizations around the world. We also provide training courses, including workshops and hosting conferences, and we help with infrastructure planning. We provide advice on marine data collection and processing. And we also act as a focal point for questions about tides and sea level, uh, not just from kind of institutes, governments, uh, agencies and uh, industry, but also from members of the public. Uh, most recently, one of the things we did this year was Andy Matthews provided some updates to the GGOS website about our service. And I just thought that I'd go through a bit of the information he provided for people in the audience that might not know what we do. So um, obviously early tie gauges were just simple stacks on a harbour wall, which an observer would read off. And they developed in the 19th century into automatic recording systems where a float pulled a pulley and this drew a pen on a rotating drum. But mostly modern sensors are pressure sensors in the water or they're acoustic or radar sensors that bounce beam off the surface from above. And one of the most recent developments is that we're using GNSS receivers as tie gauges by comparing a direct signal with a multipath reflection off the water. A typical tie gauge, uh, the water height is tied to a physical point on land, the primary benchmark. By measuring the height above the local tie gauge datum, defined a fixed distance below this benchmark. The stability of the primary benchmark is then monitored by comparison leveling to a network of nearby benchmarks. And also we ask that local land movement is monitored by locating the site with a GNSS receiver. Uh, so tie gauges obviously they measure relative sea level and the height of the sea level is relative to this fixed point on land, the primary benchmark. And changes in relative sea level can result from local land movements. And for this reason, tie gauges have played an important part in the historical role in geodesy. Some of our earliest records come from the Baltic, where we've got apparent fall in sea level records, but that's just because the ice, the land is recovering after glacial isostatic adjustment. And tie gauges have also been used to define datums for national and regional levelling systems. And this is a photograph of the UK's primary national benchmark in Newlyn. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about some of our recent activities. Uh, so all tie gauges should be equipped with a GNSS receiver located as closely as possible to the tie gauge. And this is actually a requirement of the Global Sea Level Observing System. So we want to know the ellipsoidal heights of the main benchmark and also the tie gauge data. Um, there's also research efforts aimed at determining the geocentric global sea level right rises as well as regional changes in sea level. And we use these uh, GNSS uh, data for vertical land movement and satellite altimeter calibration. So historically, there's been a lack of information linking the geodetic ties between the tie gauges and the GNSS. And it's often complicated by the fact that the tie gauge is maintained by one organization and the GNSS by a separate organization. Uh, but we're working with the geodetic community to uh, deploy GNSS receivers really closely to tie gauges and making sure that the resulting tie gauge data and GNSS data are publicly available within uh, international data archives as well. And we want to encourage the establishment of geodetic ties between GNSS and tie gauges. Uh, and Andy Matthews was an advisor on this recent report about co-locating GNSS with tie gauges. And this is mostly uh, with a European focus, this report. Um, another thing about the GNSS at tie gauges. So GNSS, as I mentioned before, suffers from multipath errors, um, but we can use that uh, to monitor sea level by looking at the noise change as sea level rises and falls, and you can get sea level data from the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and the GNSS record also gives you a vertical, uh, a record of the vertical height as well. And GNSS IR is a, a and the use of low cost GNSS sensors uh, to measure sea level may actually help us fill in gaps in our current global tie gauge network. 
So as mentioned earlier, it's really important that we maintain this tie between the tie gauges and the GNSS. And if we use GNSS IR for sea level at sites, this link is already made and it all, um, helps us monitor the land motion at site as well automatically. As part of the EuroC project, we created this portal to distribute um, sea level data from 250 GNSS stations. We also created an interactive planning tool to help users determine where the best place to put a GNSS sensor at a location might be. So you do get GNSS at harbours, but sometimes the view, the view of the sea is blocked either by um, parts of the harbour or boats or something. So we've got a tool that helps automatically mask out reflections from these areas and plan where the best place to put a GNSS sensor would be for sea level. We've also recently installed in the UK a couple of sites where we've got a new tie gauge and GNSS installation. And this is just some uh, data, some high frequency sea level data from the GNSS IR installation. Another of our most recent activities was a citizen science project. And in 2021, we launched the UK Tides project following a recommendation from the IOC workshop on sea level data archaeology. And the aim was to add new data to our database and increase the use of mean sea level data. And we actually had more than 3,000 volunteers help us digitize over nearly 100 years worth of data from two sites in the northwest of England using the Zooniverse Citizen Science platform. They worked at about the rate of five full time experts, and it took them just over a year to digitize all these data. And we're currently QCing this information, and it, some of it's already been used uh, to help validate storm surge events. So this is the recovered data from the two sites, St George's Period, Liverpool and Hilbury Island. Some of the records also contained met information and daily pressure. And obviously this rescued data can be assimilated into existing and future models to improve reconstructions of the past. And this is just a, a picture of a storm surge from Storm Ulysses in 1983. This data, it's from a paper that's currently in pre-press, but our data have help, helped improve this uh, prediction of this storm surge. Uh, another upcoming activity is that we're forming an IAPSO tidal analysis best practice group. So methods to analyze and predict the tide at a given location have changed over time, but most people use the harmonic method of tidal analysis. So that's just where you um, break down your tidal observations into various sinusoidal functions. And it's usually carried out by a number of software packages that are freely available. And these have been really useful, but they have within them a series of assumptions and decisions that you need to carry, you, you need to make in order to carry out this harmonic analysis. And these are often hard coded in the software um, and different software has different assumptions. So in this workshop on tidal analysis, we're going to do an investigation of the current uh, state of tidal analysis across various different institutions, the theory behind tidal constituents, the methods used to come to a solution and the main sources and the consequences of error. And uh, hopefully this is going to lead to a best practice document on tidal analysis. And this working group is hopefully going to be held alongside the IUGG General Assembly next year. Uh, and finally, uh, I'd just like to talk about some of the work we're doing on data and metadata. And we're committed to ensuring free and open, timely access to data and metadata. And we need to work towards achieving fair data principles, metadata harmonization, while ensuring that everybody involved in the data lifecycle is given proper credit for their contributions. So PSMSL is involved with several international working groups. Um, we're working with the Research Data Alliance on persistent identifiers for sensors. Uh, we're also working with the GGOS working group on digital object identifiers. And we're working with the Global Ocean Observing System uh, Observations Coordination Group, again, on metadata and data flow. And we're also working with the other GLOSS data centers to set up an ERDAP server for data sharing and metadata sharing. And um, there's various other things that are happening, but I'm conscious of time and that everyone wants a tea break. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mike, do you want some closing remarks or statements? Uh, yes. Um... Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, everyone for participating uh, in the in this session. Uh, one thing about the, uh, the Bureau of Networks and Observations is 
it's it's pretty it's a pretty diverse group. Uh, we've a lot of pieces and parts going, and uh, I just want to commend uh, you know, all the all the participants uh, in in the uh, uh, in, in the uh, in, in the BN, BNNO sounds like a railroad uh, for your your participation. I mean, it's uh, fantastic, and I look at the the progress that has been made um, by by the committees. Uh, by the services, uh, it's it, it's very impressive, and uh, so I want, I want to thank you all for your continued uh, hard work and your participation in the bureau. Yes, thank you. Okay, and with this, I would like to close this session. Okay, hello everyone. I would start with the next session about the focus area geohazards. And yes, John is already here. And please, John. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very sorry that um, I'm not able to attend in person at this meeting, but hopefully uh, we have uh, um, in uh, coming in July, we have a uh, uh, a general assembly of the IUGG, and I hope that we can all meet there and discuss uh, the advances further. Um, what I have not been able to get uh, the members uh, that are currently involved in this effort together, uh, but uh, they have been very responsive in, in requests for input, and uh, we have some. Uh, uh, advances to report, and uh, uh, I'm sure we're going to have a very much more active uh, uh, effort in the coming year. Uh, we've all, just like everybody here, we've been affected by um, the pandemic, as well as uh, a couple of uh, unfortunate um, uh, uh, problems, health problems, but uh, I think uh, we're uh, pretty much over that. So let me let me start by giving a, a, a status report on the uh, uh, G2's early warning system. That's a GNSS tsunami early warning system. All right, uh, uh, this, this illustration on the left really uh, attempts to identify uh, the many hazards which can be addressed largely through um, uh, uh, our GNSS capabilities, um, from volcanic explosions to flooding to uh, tsunamis uh, and uh, earthquakes, of course, uh, as well as uh, general environmental monitoring. We just saw how GNSS can be used for uh, monitoring sea level, which is a, a wonderful new application, but also uh, ground, uh, ground um, uh, water, uh, ground uh, soil humidity, rather, uh, and uh, uh, snow uh, pack, etc. cetera. So uh, it's a very useful device. Uh, what we're doing here, what was motivated what motivated our efforts in uh, GNSS tsunami early warning was really the remarkable uh, efforts uh, since uh, uh, the major earthquakes of uh, uh, 20, uh, 2004 and 2011 in uh, uh, Sumatra and uh, uh, Japan. And First, there was a call for a better uh, effort to monitor uh, these large mega thrust earthquakes, which created, brought on uh, devastating tsunamis. And then uh, very quickly, the community responded uh, by um, uh, developing techniques and showing examples of uh, the utility of these data. Certainly over Japan, uh, the Tohoku earthquake occurred in uh, perhaps uh, un unfortunately occurred, but it occurred in a region where uh, GNSS uh, technology was very well developed and 
resulted in uh, very um, uh, informative measures of uh, uh, the crustal dynamics, displacement, as well as the impact of uh, that displacement on the ionosphere. And so what we find now is that there's a combination of approaches <coughs> that <coughs> provide uh, very good information, uh, predictive information, and also tracking information on tsunamis. So whether um, by moving forward with tsunamis, we also strengthen our efforts in addressing <coughs> many uh, natural hazards. So next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for, there's during the past decade or more, there has been a very significant advances in uh, uh, satellite and GNSS capability, as well as the regional systems of, uh, of uh, the uh, Japanese quasi QCSS, as well as the Indian IRNS or NAVIC. <coughs> and the effect to that is that uh, certain areas of the globe have been uh, uh, the availability of GNSS satellites and regional satellite navigation has uh, been uh, very much improved. And here you see that bright orange patch, which actually occurs over uh, the Western uh, Ring of Fire, where a uh, majority of our very significant earthquakes and resultant tsunamis are generated. So uh, this will be very helpful uh, multi-GNSS uh, uh, monitoring, which has been uh, advanced through the IGS, uh, is uh, proving uh, very useful. So we'll see uh, some of that next slide. Not the next slide, but uh, within this presentation. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, uh, G2s or the uh, GNSS tsunami early warning systems is a multidisciplinary technique. It involves, uh, 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 first of all, geodesy, but it also involves uh, a very, um, uh, uh, a very involved modeling of uh, crustal dynamics, because we use the crustal displacement to estimate, um, first of all, the magnitude of the earthquake. And, uh, and its distribution of crustal displacement, as well as the resultant displacement of the uh, ocean bottom, which uh, generates uh, tsunamis. And therefore, we need uh, a suite of modeling capability that will take us from that crustal displacement to uh, oceanic surface displacement. In addition to that, um, the uh, surface displacement tends to induce uh, the uh, acoustic uh, wave coupling uh, dynamics in the ionosphere. And the GPS receivers are able to monitor uh, total electron content along the propagation path and therefore able to identify uh, waves induced into the ionosphere, the F1 layer or so. Um, uh, which uh, basically allow us to uh, track the tsunami as it moves across the ocean. Furthermore, uh, in the initial phases, if you look down below in the lower right-hand corner, um, the upper left one of these images uh, illustrates a very intense uh, anomaly in it's the ionospheric uh, uh, TEC anomaly, so very intense anomaly that uh, some of our researchers believe will give us additional insight into the magnitude of the uh, accumulating uh, tsunami signal. So um, combined displacement and ionospheric monitoring can result in, um, uh, first of all, the prediction of a tsunami and later 
the, val uh, the verification of the existing tsunami and subsequently the tracking. All this can, has been shown to be able to be done within about a minute and a half for the prediction of the tsunami uh, from uh, the initial earthquake. And, uh, and Martin, could you move it to the next slide? Whoa. Yes, sorry, the, the connection was bad. Yes, I can move to Thank the next. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> As a result, um, we, we uh, in the 2015 General Assembly of uh, the IUGG, uh, a resolution number four was uh, passed and it called upon uh, the uh, IUGG member nations uh, to implement GNSS augmentations to tsunami early warning systems. As I said earlier, the ability of GNSS uh, to uh, increase the rate or, or the time uh, warning uh, or decrease the, the warning time for a tsunami is very significant and also it is a very efficient mesh method. Uh, the Japanese have very large networks, for example, um, in, on the ocean shelf to, uh, uh, to monitor pressure uh, from a potential resulting tsunami. Uh, many nations of the world don't have that capability, but they do have uh, GNSS capability. And so we believe uh, this will be very advantageous to uh, the developing nations, uh, particularly around uh, the uh, ring of fire. Uh, in 2016, following that, the GGOS issued a call for prep, uh, participation in the GATU working group. And today uh, that uh, working group comprises of, is comprised of uh, 18 organizations from 12 nations. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the report. Uh, we held a workshop, uh, the GATU group, uh, supported by uh, the IUGG and uh, NASA and a number of other, uh, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, et cetera, uh, held a workshop in Tohoku, Japan. And uh, a result of that earthquake uh, workshop was um, was a report uh, which has been published, and on this slide we have links to those reports, and I recommend that you read them if possible. Uh, they have recommendations on how to implement uh, their recommendations. Um, uh, for uh, advancement of the G2s, and we're trying to follow that um, uh, those recommendations uh, in uh, in within the geohazards uh, work a uh, focus area. Next slide. The <clears throat> here uh, we have a, a diagram, a schematic of how. Uh, uh, the uh, modeling for earthquake displacement occurs uh, and uh, a tsunami uh, estimation of, uh, of uh, prediction of an existing tsunami, of a uh, developing tsunami. Uh, most Im important is, of course, the uh, collection of GNSS data, which needs to be done in real time and uh, relies on, uh, on uh, <coughs> appropriate data sharing and software sharing amongst the participating nations because tsunamis are an international problem, an international threat. Uh, within about 60 seconds, uh, existing software is able to estimate the magnitude of the earthquake and the resultant displacements. Uh, the, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, with uh, an inversion of uh, 
of a uh, finite uh, fault model. And uh, we, uh, within about 120 seconds, we have a, a finite fault model, which provides a very uh, good estimate of the ground displacement beneath uh, the uh, ocean, uh, beneath the shelf. And there, and from that, we can uh, create a tsunami model and the prediction. Uh, but this, this will await the analysis of ionospheric signals. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, what's really required here and which has been most difficult, uh, particularly in the Western Pacific, as we'll see shortly, is international collaboration. We need uh, uh, both software and data sharing across uh, boundaries. Uh, we uh, need an improved multi-GNSS real-time network with very strong maintenance activity, uh, which we'll see the impact uh, very shortly. Um, we need uh, regional broadband access. Recent advances in satellite internet may provide a solution to that, but we still have an issue of uh, funding uh, this capability. And finally, uh, we need advanced computational infrastructure, uh, global cloud computing and or regional uh, processing facilities. Next slide. So how many um, GNSS real-time multi uh, constellation uh, receivers do we need? Well, we know that there are about 18,000 receivers out there in the world, uh, uh, but they are not all real time. But let's first look at how many we need. Um, the uh, workshop suggested following the model of uh, Sobolev, of 2007, which is linked here, and uh, in which uh, uh, there's about a hundred kilometer spacing between stations along the ring of fire. In addition to that, across the um, the subduction zone, we have uh, it's recommended that there be three stations. So with the ring of fire uh, averaging about 40,000 kilometers, that means that we uh, require about 1,200 receivers. Uh, furthermore, we will need a broad distribution of, uh, of receivers within the ocean basin to track the ionospheric signal. Each receiver has a range uh, of about uh, 1,200 kilometers. It can, uh, it can monitor ionospheric uh, uh, def, uh, distortions uh, at, at up to about 1,200 kilometers, although uh, at shorter range, it's much more accurate in doing that. So uh, we need a total of about 1,700 real-time GNSS stations to uh, deal with the uh, uh, earth, uh, tsunami uh, uh, threat for the Indo-Pacific region. Next slide. Here you see that emphasized a little more clearly. This is the present day distribution of GNSS receivers. There are about 17,000 or more uh, uh, stations, all, all uh, public stations, but they do not broadcast in real time. There are about 1,200 receivers, 2,100 receivers broadcasting in real time. Uh, and this is, uh, this uh, is, uh, this compilation is courtesy of uh, Tim Melbourne at the Central uh, uh, Washington University. Uh, one thing to note and was noted in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, report of uh, a G2's report of 2017, uh, the 
uh, participation in data sharing from the Western and Southern Pacific far exceeds that of the Western Pacific, which unfortunately is the most, uh, Western Pacific is the most susceptible to tsunamis. Next slide. All right, so in an attempt to uh, advance uh, this problem, we uh, have uh, determined that pre uh, presently the Oceania region is uh, the uh, most important uh, area to uh, work and attempt to develop uh, a uh, G2's uh, network. That would involve real-time uh, GNSS receivers. Already New Zealand and Australia are working to expand that but also it will um, uh, work to uh, create a broader data sharing and capability amongst these nations and uh, furthermore improve the computational facilities. Um, and here you see a list of uh, the people that currently are working uh, within the group to advance that effort. We, uh, <clears throat> Uh, via Allison Craydock, we have uh, participation from the IGS Central Bureau, and as well as GEO, we worked earlier to develop the Geodesy for Sendai effort, in which we'll uh, provide uh, a forum uh, for uh, this meeting on Oceana. Uh, and we have uh, financial resources being made available from the GEO Risk Commission, plus uh, potential other uh, sources uh, to support the meeting. Uh, and of course, our uh, GGOS geohazards uh, focus area. But more than that, we seek uh, the uh, support of the UNGGIM for the Asian Pacific, uh, as well as a number of other uh, groups and agencies. Uh, we also would like to get uh, private uh, participation, uh, particularly from uh, computing for, uh, resources and uh, internet capabilities. Um, we hope to hold this meeting in the spring of next year. Uh, there isn't much time left to uh, organize such a meeting, but we will try. We'd like to have it uh, completed in time for uh, the IUGG General Assembly in uh, Munich. I mean, in uh, Berlin, sorry, uh, next July. Next slide. This is, of course, a, uh, uh, a schematic diagram of the many islands and nations of the Oceania. Uh, they're very separate. Uh, we, we hear of uh, uh, challenges to cooperation within uh, that group. Uh, we hope that uh these they're very susceptible uh, very susceptible group certainly very interested in uh tsunami uh, uh dangers so uh furthermore uh they would benefit greatly both economically and from their uh national uh disaster uh uh profiles uh, from uh, uh, enhanced GNSS capabilities as well as the computing capabilities. Next slide. If you click on this, uh, there's a little bit of a movie, but uh, what I want to uh, impress upon you is the, is the uh, stability of the GNSS solutions from New Zealand and Australia. This far exceeds that observed uh, in the Americas. And it stems from a very careful uh, maintenance of and updating of the receiver uh, receivers for that region. It also shows the available um, uh, uh, real-time stations within, uh, the, uh, uh, within the Oceania region. Uh, we hope to increase that very significantly through uh, our efforts for uh, the Oceana, uh, G2's Oceana. 
Uh, this is from uh, the GPS cockpit. And I invite you folks to, uh, to visit that site. It's very impressive. It provides the displacement measurements uh, for tsunami early warning. And hopefully there will be others, other capabilities that we will unearth as we uh, uh, within this meeting. Next slide. You can click on uh, that slide as well. Uh, this is a product of the Guardian uh, ionospheric monitoring capability. It also is a multi-GNSS capability using many of the same uh, real-time stations available. And this is a, uh, a uh, measurement uh, taken on December 20th, 2021 uh, of the Hunga uh, Tonga uh, explosion. Uh, we were hoping to get this uh, real in real time at that time, but unfortunately, the Guardian software was undergoing uh, uh, validation at JPL, and it was not operating at the time. But it provides a very good measurement of uh, of the um, uh, background ionosphere, the total TEC. Uh, and uh, which is expressed in uh, white for minimization, which occurred over the explosion, as well as the uh, high rate uh, variability of TEC from uh, the gravity waves, which developed as a result of that explosion. Next slide. So um, Melbourne, I mean, uh, New, uh, Berlin next year, uh, we will have uh, a, a meeting of the uh, uh, IUGG General Assembly, and there are a number of uh, presentations that we hope to uh, uh, have on uh, the uh, Oceana uh, G2's meeting, uh, as well as uh, on uh, general uh, early warning systems uh, for geohazards. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, the folks here will see fit to uh, uh, contribute to that meeting. Uh, and uh, we look forward to it. Uh, next slide. As you might imagine, there also is a very uh, uh, great uh, application potential for artificial intelligence and machine learning in processing these real-time data. And uh, there will be a union symposium on that uh, topic. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, folks here will contribute. Next slide. So in summary, uh, what uh, we, uh, the message I hope to relate here is that G2s can be implementing, implemented using currently available technology and measurement systems. G2s benefits are based currently on the available GNSS signals, commercial GNSS receivers, analysis algorithms, broadband communications such as uh, generation four, uh, now uh, G5 uh, uh, cell phone networks. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, current effort now will be on uh, assembling the Oceana community to see whether or not uh, we can uh, produce enough support for LG2's network for that region. Uh, we need uh, optimization of real-time GNSS networks that currently exist, if possible. We really don't seek to uh, develop uh, new stations, but we need to update them to multi-GNSS real-time operation. We need international agreements for the distribution of GNSS real-time data and their products. And we need the cooperation of disaster response agencies. Um, 
I can't say that the collaboration is optimal at this time, uh, but hopefully uh, it will grow as uh, this capability is further demonstrated. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Other questions? There's a question in the chat. So thanks for the interesting presentation. My question is whether you put AI in your tsunami uh, early warning system, data processing chain, for data processing or decision making, et cetera. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the, these data really uh, need to be uh, added to uh, the software of uh, well, the present, the two packages which I discussed here, but there are many others such as a regard system of Japan uh, and the, uh, uh, the capabilities uh, from both New Zealand, Australia, and Chile. Uh, I don't know about uh, the Australian, New Zealand, uh, or the Chilean systems, or the Japanese regard system. So we hope uh, to have uh, a good amount of, uh, of uh, information from these in, in this upcoming meeting. I do know that both um, uh, the cock a GPS cockpit effort, as well as the Guardian system, is working on employing of machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you. There will be a comment by or question by Alison. Hi. Um, actually, that's a really good question. Just to follow up on what John was saying is that that's one of the things that we were working on in conjunction with the International Telecommunications Union. So uh, John showed a, a, a call for participation for uh, a session at the IUGG uh, that's all about uh, artificial intelligence for natural disasters. And that is the same group that part of our external relations has been working with. Uh, we had a couple of uh, people who are willing to submit use cases of, of concepts for using artificial intelligence for decentralized GNSS data processing. So it, it, as was pointed out, we have two big roadblocks that are preventing this from, from moving forward. One is being able to have the political support to share real-time data, and the other being bandwidth. You could have a small island state with every wish to share all the data that they have, but the bandwidth is very low, or even in some cases, as we saw with our colleagues in Tonga, interrupted. So how could we possibly start thinking about how to use a decentralized, uh, analysis system that could analyze domestically the raw GNSS real-time data and then only export the data the data derived product so that uh, governments or other entities that may wish to keep their real-time data private can do that and they can still contribute to the greater good so yes we are um, trying to little by little start to explore opportunities in AI uh, unfortunately, oh, not, not, not unfortunately. Um, so we, uh, the Guardian system was one of the groups that submitted a use case to be included with this AI uh, for natural disaster management. And I have heard that this will actually be uh, proposed to the World Meteorological Organization, uh, the, the overall effort of AI for natural disasters. Uh, will be proposed as a, an ongoing initiative. So right now it's just kind of a topic group for an ITU study group and it will make recommendations. But moving forward, there might be more opportunities. And if, you, if you're at all interested in playing with AI and geodesy, please uh, send me an email. Uh, we want to hear from you. And so, um, yeah. I, I would also add that uh, in support of the, the G2's effort, we've been able to establish a new task force within the UN International Committee on GNSS, and that would be GNSS for disaster risk reduction. 
and part of that will be a joint pilot project to be proposed to the IGS governing board next month uh, on uh, furthering this work in uh, GNSS enhancements to tsunami early warning. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, Alison. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, I think we could close this focus area to uh, hazard uh, session. Uh, and with this, uh, I would like to hand over to um, Basara or Detlef, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the final part of our uh, meeting is in a, any other business is uh, we still have uh, I think 20 minutes for the discussion of other businesses. Do you have anything I uh, want to discuss here? Okay, Martin, please. Um, hello. Um, I think uh, uh, with the end of this um, TIGUS IGT period, uh, also the uh, focus area of um, um, Laura will, will be closed, the unified site system. And maybe there's also a place uh, for other focus areas. So um, a question to, to all of you, um, if you have some topic in mind, which, which could be uh, uh, used as a new focus area in Chigos, where Chigos can be an incubator, uh, an, an incubator for uh, such a topic. Um, please make a suggestion, um, because we are open to, to some new topics. Or maybe only think about it and, and let us know. Um, maybe in future. Yes, and thank you very much, Martin, for the uh, suggestion. And uh, so we are looking for the next uh, topics of Jigos focus areas. So uh, please let, let us know if you have any ideas about uh, what we should focus on in the next coming years. Okay, uh, any other thing? Um, I do have a, a question uh, brought up by uh, Allison and earlier by myself. Um, this issue of sharing of real-time data, it's, uh, it's critical. If, if we are going to um, engage in the application of GNSS to global natural hazards problems, as well as environmental problems, uh, we need to uh, work uh, towards a uh, freeing of uh, GNSS uh, or interchange of GNSS data. This is, this is a decades long problem uh, and uh, we need to find ways in which to approach uh, the national concerns on this issue. And I suggest that uh, this is an issue related to uh, the IGS and uh, and even the the GGOS. We've tried to avoid this uh, problem largely by focusing on uh, a very large scale tectonic uh, uh, plate problems, uh, and, but. Uh, we need to begin to look at uh, local uh, higher mesoscale uh, GNSS uh, and geodetic data. It's a very important uh, for uh, regional uh, and uh, global uh, environmental problems. And uh, I believe that technology has moved well beyond the sensitivities of, uh, of uh, that GNSS currently pose to uh, uh, national security. And uh, I, I, I think that 
this is no longer uh, such a, an important issue. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can address this both uh, uh, through diplomacy as well as through statements uh, from the GIGAS. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I fully agree with you and uh, we should do uh, something to address this. Any other comments? Yeah, uh, Mike, uh, John, let me respond to that. Uh, what about other organizations? I mean, like uh, I was thinking, you know, we're, we're doing work now with the UNGGIM uh, uh, at a high enough level where there are uh, representatives there uh, who could be addressed. Uh, I think it's really, really important for uh, the UN to uh, ask the countries to share the data. Uh, usually it's just recommendation. The UN cannot force the countries to do so. It's really difficult, I think, from my experience. Um, the recommendation uh, to, uh, ask, uh, to ask countries to share the data, especially real time data, is already included in the, for example, uh, the resolution of the UNGGM AP Asia Pacific, uh, the from the Jodek Working Group, uh, the recommendation already includes to, uh, to recommend the member state to share the real time data because, as uh, you guys already mentioned, that the real time data is a uh, critical, essential to uh, do more work, especially for high resolution, uh, high temporal, and also uh, high dense uh, cluster deformation. It is really important. We already do the recommendation, but uh, it's still for some countries, it's really difficult to share the data because of government policy. Uh, uh, for personally, I, uh, I'm also struggling to persuade the government, uh, my institution, to share our real-time data to the uh, users, hopefully free, freely available. Uh, uh, for some stations, uh, the real-time data uh, is open, but just 10, 20 stations, and it's really difficult to open the whole uh, uh, 1,300 real-time data. Uh, that's the situation. But anyway, uh, we, we need to continue to the, uh, to say it is important to share the real-time data and the all countries need, need to share the data to openly free available. Perhaps uh, this is a group uh, uh, that uh, a focus area that should be formed within the GDOS. Uh, for uh, the advancement of um, real-time data sharing. Thank you very much. Um, uh, any other thing? Okay, so uh, if if not, I would like to uh, say uh, some words at, at the closing of this meeting. First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, to participate in the Jigo uh, uh, Stays a uh, face-to-face meeting after COVID-19. I'm really happy to have you all here, and I would like to also thank all speakers and also session chairs uh, for their presentation and also a very active discussions, not only uh, reporting, but also raising a very important challenges and issues for GIGOS. And I uh, also would like to express my thanks to the local hosts, uh, German Jurek Commission, and also uh, Barbarian Academy of Science and Humanities, and also uh, Technical University of Munich, uh, kindly host the, this uh, meeting at this wonderful venue. 
uh, I really thank the hospitality. And I also thank the Martin uh, to taking care of all presentations and uh, 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 running the a whole uh, presentation in the meeting. And I also would like to uh, special thanks for uh, this left, Dr. Hanzama, to take care of, of the old meeting. And uh, so uh, I would like to hand over this left to make some uh, final remarks of this meeting. Thank you, Basara, for your kind works and uh... I also would like to thank all you for uh, this uh, nice uh, meeting here. So you all, you contributed a lot, very nice presentations, fruitful discussions. And I really appreciate that we could have a, uh, at least a partly in-person meeting. And uh, I also like to thank the uh, large number of participants who were connected remotely. I uh, think this uh, also shows the interest in GIGOS activities. And uh, I really would like uh, to point out one, one thing. So after two years of mainly virtual meetings, it's, it's really a pleasure to, to have again face-to-face -face discussions. And I think it's really important also the, the discussions besides the official program in the breaks and uh, during the dinner last last night. And it's these things will never happen in, in virtual meetings. So I think it is really important to have this face-to-face -face meetings. And I hope that we will have in future uh, always again face-to-face -face meetings. I, I thank you all for, for your contributions and uh, on, on behalf of the local organizing committee and, and all the participants, I would express my special thanks to Julia. So Julia, please come in front. So, <laughs> please come. And so you did an excellent job in preparing the figure days and uh, I, we appreciate it all very much. And so we have uh, some more present for you. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay, and then I, I wish you all uh, a safe trip back home uh, to those who are leaving, but many of you are still uh, We'll be here for the next two days for the strategic planning meeting. Uh, so we will have many fruitful discussions also the next two days. I'm convinced about that. And we will have the strategic planning meeting here in the same room. We will put the tables a little bit closer together. And uh, so I uh, uh, wish you all the best and nice trip back home. And for those we see tomorrow, I'm happy to see you tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye.